My name's Angelo, and welcome to We Want Picks. My small, freckled friend and I are going to break down the entire UFC 300 fight card. We're going to give you our picks, predictions, bets, and DraftKings plays. But before I do, let's take a look at the wild success that Jakey Boy and I have had during the pay-per-views of 2024. We've been crushing 2024 pay-per-views. Overall, almost 12 units of net profit across three events. There's only been three pay-per-views this year so far. But I gave you four safety parlays this year, and they all did very well. Overall, on pay-per-views in 2024, we have given you almost 30% ROI. Just astonishing numbers from the pay-per-view boys. And honestly, I think that uh, you're kind of an, an astonishing person. Thank you so much. This I'm is great. I want to, I'm in a great mood and I want to just be, I want to make a positive. Both Jake. Agree, yeah. Can we both yeah. agree that today, tonight is just going to be pure positivity. I'm, I'm all for it. No fighting tonight. Anyway, my safety parlay has crushed during pay-per-views historically. Just like you crush every fucking chair you sit on. You fat, <laughs> you piece of shit. fat, <laughs> you fat nerd. We almost made it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, One minute and 23 seconds. Either way, the safety parlay does insanely well overall, especially during pay-per-views. The last six pay-per-views, I gave you nine safety parlays. They returned almost seven units of net profit. I have hit 12 of the last 17 safety parlays overall. That is only one single bet. And if you want to unlock that one single bet, go to wewantpicks.com. Click become a member at the top. It's only $10 for an entire month, but premium membership is far more than just that one bet. You're also going to get tools. One of those tools is the line movement tracker. This is going to give you the opening odds, the current odds, the win probability, and the line movement for every single fighter on every single card. Sadiq Youssef had a good amount of movement this week, and Calvin Qatar opened as a favorite and is closing as an underdog. You're also going to get... Cater. It is Cater. We'll talk about that when we break it down. You're also going to get the detailed data metrics and analytics. This is 38 columns of information at your fingertips that you can use to jump in or jump out of bets that make sense for you. I personally like to use it for prop bets. On Fridays, Bet Online, DraftKings, and a few other books give you the significant strike lines. They give you the takedown lines, and right there you can see the fighter, their opponent, how many strikes they get hit with, how many strikes they land. Everything I'm mentioning and so much more is only $10 a month. One single package. We don't separate betting from DFS. We don't charge you astronomical numbers. But it's $10 a month for every single card that month. You're also going to get the best DraftKings ownership projections in the game. If you're a DraftKings fantasy kind of guy and you like to build your DraftKings fantasy lineups, you know how insanely important these numbers are. And we quite literally have the best numbers in the game. And they are preloaded into the DraftKings Optimizer. This will build one lineup for you. This will build 150 lineups for you with the click of a button. Again, the low, low price of just $10 for an entire month. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. And the last thing I will mention about freaking premium membership is it is more than just me and Jacob. It is more than just our bets. It's more than just our picks. It's more than just the tools. We have other analysts as well. We have Artem. Money giving Artem. You, giving, Artem went 10 and 2 at last week's UFC. And Artem is also giving you his PFL picks and bets and other regional cards. And the Pick Doctor has developed an artificial intelligence. We do have an AI. It is picking fights at a very, very high rate. I think it's 67% on average this year and is doing insanely well. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It is $10 a month for every single thing I mentioned and all the things that I didn't mention. Yes, handsome Jake. I'm going to keep the po- I'm going to keep the positivity. No, you can I, do you. I'm, I'm going to keep it. Go ahead. I thought I did pretty well with not interrupting during that. I just want to kind of toot myself. There. I was surprised. I was also, surprised. Oh, excuse me. Also, um, if you could like the stream, right? If you haven't liked the stream, appreciate it. Like the stream. Just subscribe if you are new. There's probably a lot of new viewers. Guys, we have a lot of fun on here, but we get down to the brass tacks a lot of times. And we have some great, great success. We want picks.com. But also, Lock of the Week is tomorrow. Lock of the Week's had some great success this year as well. I think I'm up almost four units in totality of Lock of the Week. People want to trash Lock of the Week, Angelo? I don't know who those people are. I'm up almost 30 fucking units on Lock of the Week. Picking one underdog every single week. And I got a great one this week. So, tomorrow.
like the stream. Thanks, guys. We do have a couple of super chats before we hop in and have some fun here. Three dollars from Quint. He said, "Are we excited or are we excited like the stream?" Thank you very much, Quinty boy. Quint and is then, going to uh, UFC three hundred. Well, that's be fun. That is awesome. take a lot of pictures and share them in the Discord. We do have a Discord that is one hundred percent free, where you can share your bets, share your picks, share your opinions, pick people's brains. That link to the Discord is on the website. Just big old button right at the top. Link to Discord. Christian Balder with the dollar ninety nine. Jacob, let me know how much we betting on Jan versus Jean. We will talk about that fight when we get there. You spelled no wrong. Um, you missed the G in betting. But we will get to that fight. No spoilers. We can't address this just now. No spoilers. Stick around for that fight, and maybe Jacob will bet openly you. Sorry. I'm not Are you ready to talk. break down this yeah, card? Sorry. sorry, Christian. I know you're talking to me, but apparently. Gag order. Not allowed to talk, Christian. Oh, Apologize we're just going to spoil the pick? We're we're on opposite sides. Okay. I can say that. And so I was going to say that it depends. He Because he's because he asked me in Discord how much he wants to bet, too. And I said it depends how much Angela wants to bet. So when we get there, you know, stay tuned, boys and girls. There we go. You ready? Ready, Freddy. Oh, wait. 1999 from Dr. Y. Ooh, 20 spot from Dr. <laughs> y. Live stream, card opening, donation. Jacob will not be opening cards on this live stream. We appreciate you very I can much, show Dr. You guys y. All my, I have all my autograph cards. I can just go one by one and show you. Here. Yeah, no, we would appreciate absolutely that, love y. that. We are not opening cards on this live stream, but thank you very much for that $20. One of the most supportive guys that we have here. Let's go. Wait, hold on. Okay, let's go. Opening up. The UFC 300 fight card. We have Divison Figueredo taking on Cody Garbrandt. Two former champions from different weight classes trying to work their way back to the belt. We have Divison Figueredo 22 and 3 in the entirety of his career. He is 2 2 and 1 in his last five. He is coming off a successful bantamweight debut. He's taking on Cody Garbrandt 14 and 5 overall. 3 and 2 in his last five. He's on a nice to fight win streak at this point we both both we nope man oh. i told myself i was like this is a big card don't don't mess it up no weird bumbling lose the lisp keep it together don't get mad at that annoying twerp you do the show with just keep it together and then i get to cody garbrandt you know? well you know once once my mine tongue was folded, a joke but that one was that one was more serious it was because because you you recognize that it is most likely true you're twerpish and you are a bit of a nudge. Anyway, both of these men we should be familiar with at this point. Divas and Figueredo, the long reigning 125 pound champion. As we all know, it was one of the only quadrilogies we have ever seen in the UFC. He fought Brandon Moreno four times. Divas and Figueredo at 125 pounds, decent power in his hands, good takedowns, good jujitsu, a little bit of dog in him. BJJ black belt, well-rounded skills that obviously got him to the belt, and he then defended that belt a couple of times. But the weight cuts were a little too much. He got finished twice by Brandon Moreno, and he said, I need to reinvent myself. I need to go up and wait. He gained 10 pounds, went up and wait. He made his UFC debut at bantamweight against Rob Font, and he turned into a Nurmaga Madoff brother. He just took Rob Font down over and over and over again, exposed Rob Font's takedown defense a Wait, little bit. Wait, did you say something about a debut? 135-pound debut. For Garbrandt, he was the 35 champ. I'm talking about Divas and Figueredo. I've been talking about Divas in this entire time. Remember when I said that annoying twerp? Yeah. Anyway... He exposed Rob Font's takedown defense in that fight. He's taking on Cody Garbrandt, who I will be breaking down now. Cody Garbrandt was the 135-pound champion. He beat Dominic Cruz to win that belt in one of the best performances I've ever seen. People in the comment section seem to be annoyed anytime that gets mentioned. But that was a spectacular performance. He had incredible footwork, fast hands, the wrestling threat. Skill-wise, Cody Garbrandt, is very good at every single thing in MMA. He's got very fast technical striking. He has good power in his hands. He's got very good wrestling, phenomenal footwork. What he does lack is self-control and a chin. He can't control the chin. He's got to take that up with the Lord. That's the chin that he was given. The self-control is his fault. 
He is so fast, and he has so much success in a lot of these fights that he starts chasing, he gets aggressive, he makes mistakes, and he gets knocked out. I do think Cody Garbrandt can win this fight. People hate that pick. There's a couple of picks on this card that people came from my head in the comment section. I think Cody Garbrandt can win this fight for a couple of reasons. I genuinely think he is the better fighter. I think the only thing Divas and Figueredo is better at is just straight-up jiu-jitsu. He's a very high-level BJJ guy. He's got the better jiu-jitsu, but he has to get it to the ground. Cody Garbrandt is not Rob Font. Cody Garbrandt has very good wrestling credentials. He is bigger. He is faster. He's an actual wrestler who has been wrestling for a while. I think he can defend the takedowns. I think he can get some of his own if he wants. And even though Figgy had power at 125, I don't know if he has the power to knock out, admittedly, a chinny, Cody Garbrandt at 135 pounds. Razor thin pick for me, but I think Cody Garbrandt at plus 260, phenomenal odds. What do you think, Jakey boy? So what would be your breakdown of Cody winning this fight? How does he win this fight? How do you see him winning this fight? Defends the takedowns and wins the striking exchanges. He's the fast. He's the faster striker and the more technical boxer. You agree with those two statements? I don't disagree. Bang. I'm, I'm, Next up, no, I'm, I'm gonna be um, I'm gonna be rooting for Cody. There's no doubt about that. And I have nothing against Figgy, but Cody's just to see his career, the ups and downs, and then he, it seems like he's back, and then he stumbles again. And he's, I mean, in almost every single one of those fights, he looks pretty good in those fights until he does it. And like Angel mentioned, a lot of it is his fault, which is actually kind of a good thing because it's not like he's a a bad striker with bad defense who's just getting caught all the time and you don't really know why and just in bad positions. It's because he is making the mistakes. Like Angela, he is the one that fucking, he, all of a sudden you see that look in his <laughs> eye and everyone at this point literally knows like, Cody, no, don't do it. And he just cocks back that right hand. And he just starts letting it fly and that's how he is getting caught. And it, it, to his credit, in the last couple of fights, he's kind of gone away from that. Obviously with Brian Keller, he, he landed the shot and, didn't, and ended up knocking him out. But in that Trevin Jones fight, that's what he did. He was very technical. It was very boring. And I think that this fight is very, very boring. Because both of these guys are counter-striker type guys. Figgy is the one that's going to be pressuring forward. Almost like Trevin Jones. Probably a little bit more aggressive than Trevin Jones. Wanting to counter. Waiting for that right hand. And Cody's going to be the dancing against the fence. Boom, boom, boom. Left, left, left. Right, right, right. Throw a little combination. And if Cody is able to do that for 15 minutes. And my, my game plan for Cody would be this. Dance around, dance around, touch, touch, because you are the faster striker. And if you're just in and out and you're not worried about winning every single exchange, you're just scoring points, you can win this fight. The, th the second thing I would do is 30 seconds to go and every single round, because they're probably going to be close exchanges, boom. Shoot a takedown. Takedown. Boom. Because Figgy will give you the takedown. He will chase those submissions, those guillotines. 30 seconds left. You should be able to stay safe. You're going to win the rounds. That's how Cody win this fight. But I think UFC 300 is going to fire a lot of people up. I think Figgy's really going to get in his face. And anytime you see Cody pressed against that fence and somebody's right in his face, it's like it, it's go time. And I think he's going to make a mistake again. And Figgy's not a guy that you can make a mistake on. So I got to go Figgy here. I understand what you're saying. But I, I think it's one of those situations where he's got to fight perfect for 15 minutes. And, you know, aside from that Trevin Jones fight where he really was like dancing around, you know, I think Figgy's pressure is going to be a little bit too much. What's funny is going into this fight, Devis and Figueredo is questioning Cody Garbrandt's um, mental stability, right? He's saying he's a bit, a bit of a mental midget. He's not all there. He doesn't, you know, whatever. Figgy is the one we've seen quit. We've seen that man quit. We've seen him broken. We've never seen Cody quit. His chin quits on him, but he's not a choice. We have seen Figgy take the beating from Brandon Moreno and be like, I'm done. I'm done. Let me take it. I'm done. You know what I'm saying? Like, isn't that a bizarre... It's a bizarre yeah, thing. Nobody's ever questioned Cody's, like, uh, willingness to fight. He's not a coward. Right. And, and Cody's been uh, in uh, in Vegas, too. I think he's really been trying to, like, lock in for this camp. He's with all the Vegas team and their dietitians and their strength and conditioning people. So, I mean, he's there and he's... I mean, I love Cody. Cody's a fun, fun guy. No, C Cody's great. Uh, the worst thing that ever happened to Cody Garbrandt is... He almost had TJ Dillashaw knocked out. That is literally the worst thing that ever happened to him because he almost well, he had almost TJ Dillashaw. Twice. I mean, he had him well, twice in yeah, both fights. The first, the first time was such a bad knockout. He almost had, if you didn't right. know, he defending his belt for the first time. He had TJ Dillashaw like 99% knocked out, comes charging in reckless, and TJ lands one big shot, and that was it. 
And his chin has literally never been the same since. The exact same thing happened in the rematch. His chin has never been the same since. That's the worst thing that ever happened. If he beat TJ Dillashaw the same way he beat Dominic Cruz, Jesus, man, that chin wouldn't be gone. It's crazy. It's not like he's fallen <laughs> off. Obviously, his chin's given up, but you still see flashes of Cody Garbrandt. Yeah. But that, I mean, that Dominic Cruz fight was just like, holy fucking shit, man. It was a master class. Dude, Cody so Garbrandt fast. at $7,100 in DraftKings. If you're wondering what those giant numbers are at the top of the screen, that's DraftKings Fantasy. You get a $50,000 budget. You have to build a lineup with six fighters, and then you use that lineup to compete with other people that also have lineups, and you can do so for money. You can compete in tournaments for up to a couple hundred thousand dollars, or you can compete with your friends for zero dollars or a couple of bucks. Building my lineup, I do not think Divas and Figueredo is worth $9,100. I do understand Cody gets knocked out. I get it. I don't think Figgy's going to knock out Cody, and I don't think he's going to body him with the wrestling. So I don't think he's going to be worth the $9,100. I personally think Cody could be worth the seventy one. What do you think, Jake Lutz? I honestly think that this is one of those fights where it's like, I think it looks like the Trevin Jones fight. I, I think the, the total strikes landed between both of these so guys low. is going to be like 60. I, 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 you know, it just, it, it just feels like they're just, it seems like it's going to be a fire matchup, but we've seen Cody just dance around. We've seen Figgy just, you know, he's just stalks. He just stalks and he just stalks, you know? So I think it's gonna be boring. It's not worth it. It could be. That would be funny. The biggest event of all time. And this is quite literally the biggest event of all time. Some people sort of trash it and saying it doesn't live up to the hype. There are 12 current or former champions on this card. There are 13 fights with 26 fighters. I think 25 of them are ranked in the UFC. Like it is objectively the most stacked card of all time. No, yeah. there's no Conor McGregor, but it is the biggest card of all time. Yeah, you know what's funny is I just thought about sitting here right now is everyone was like 299 is a better card. But sitting here right now, maybe it's because 299 already happened, but it was a pretty good card. Sitting here right now, this feels much bigger. I mean, this feels bigger, yeah. you know. It literally, it literally has tw the most amount of ranked fighters and the most amount of current or former champions of any card in the history of the sport. It, what it is missing, and when we talk about the main event, we'll talk about how they just slapped that together. It is missing that one giant name, but we don't have a Ronda Rousey, right? That Those days are long gone. We don't have Brock Lesnar. Those days are long gone. Conor McGregor's never fighting a den. Those days are long gone. You know the that's only this week. So. I ho I hope they do, and I could be wrong. <laughs> I hope they do. I mean, they're tweet. I mean, he's like posting sparring videos now, and Dana posted that he's posted like coming soon. It's gonna be a, one of those the worst. I hope so. Big announcements, probably. I I I genuinely I I love it. I hope so. But without that, the only and they like, owe me like five thousand dollars. I think. The only two superstars that are left are John Jones, who has his own legal troubles right now, and Israel Adesanya, who, after getting knocked out, is like, I'm taking a break. So there literally was no superstar, but outside of the just the Trevor giant... Peak. Yeah. Name, so he can Trevor Indian Peak. burn his way to a win, just push an arm crooked and hope something happens. Anyway, guys, become a premium member. Unlock all the picks, the bets, the round line leans, and the tools for every single card, every single fight. We want picks.com. It's $10 for an entire month. You're going to get UFC 300. You're going to get Vegas 91 or whatever the hell the cards are after that. Next up at UFC 300, we have Bobby King Green taking on Jim fucking Miller. And I Whoa. said it like that. I said it like that because that is how Jim Miller has requested to be announced at UFC 300. Bruce, Bruce Buffer's like, fuck yourself. Yeah, Bruce Buffer's <laughs> like, I'm not doing it. I am not doing it. But he did officially make the request. I want you to call me Jim effing Miller. It sounds like and this is, is going to try and sneak it in to the broadcast. Probably. He's been like saying it. Actually, he did say it during the UFC Vegas 90 broadcast. It. Well, good. Jim Miller, I think, is the only unranked fighter on this card. But he is on this card because Jim Miller is the only human being on planet Earth that fought at UFC 100 and won and fought at UFC 200 and won. And now here he is securing his spot on UFC 300. If you think about the time span between UFC 100 and 200, then 200 and 300, it is absolutely insane that this man is on all three of these cards. But he is. And my camera is moving itself on its own. That's what happens. I went out, I got a fancy camera, and now I have to deal with those consequences. But this should be an interesting fight. This is certainly the only fight on the card that basically has no bearing on the rank rankings, no bearing on title shots or anything like that, but it should be a fun fight. We got Bobby Green, who's insanely 
That guy is just busy. He shows up every single time. 31 and 15 in his career. 2-2 two, two and 1 in his last five. He is coming off of that very late knockout loss to Jalen Turner. When I say very late, I mean he was knocked out and then continued to get mauled while that referee took his sweet time stopping that fight. He's taking on Jim Miller. As I mentioned, 37 and 17 overall. 4 and 1 in his last five. Riding a career resurgence. Four and one in his last five. This guy is 40 years old. This is not the first time they were supposed to fight. I believe this is the fourth time that this fight has been booked over the last 15 years or so. Bobby Green, he's got that Roy Jones Jr. style boxing. His hands are low. He likes to pop in and out. He likes to shoot that jab up. And he likes to stay super busy. Hide behind the jab if he can. Good up. foot. Philly Shell. Good footwork, good body work. He does avoid getting hit, but later in his career, he has been knocked out two times in his last couple of losses. He does have some solid wrestling in his back pocket. He hasn't really been wrestling since 2020, but he does have good offensive wrestling, very good defensive wrestling as well. Typically doesn't have big one-punch knockout power, but he did just knock out freaking Grant No Chin Dawson to ruin everybody's night a couple of months ago. Taking on Jimmy Mill. And Jimmy Mill is a legend. This guy literally has multiple records in the UFC for longevity, for the most amount of cage time, the most amount of fights, the most amount of wins. He has insane credentials top to bottom. He's never fought for a title. He's never going to win a title. He's never won a title. But he is Whoa. a guy that has showed up. Oh, yeah, he's going to win a title of 48. He's a guy that is going to... <laughs> <laughs> I am very, I you know I, t I think Tiffany it's because does, I haven't. I think it's because I haven't been. I, it's all like, pent up. Yeah, yeah literally, it's like you're trying to bring. It's like <laughs> it's like you love the abuse. You're like you're like just a. You know, like, <laughs> Tiffany, I mean Tiffany. I said this in one of my quick picks a few weeks ago. She is always like, "You are a bully. Like you're a bully," and some of it is on purpose. Like some of it, I know I'm being a bully, and I think some bullying is good. But um, other times I just have little outbursts like that where it's like, ooh, Jesus. I really was just ready to rip this kid apart for no reason whatsoever. Yeah, just sitting here. Just trying to get anyway, you. Not opening cards. Thank you so much. We all appreciate that. Jim Miller, I mentioned all the longevity, the career highlights, all the wins. He's never made his way like to the tippy top. He probably won't make his way to the tippy top. But he is evolving as a fighter even at 39 years old this guy started as a grappler he's a pretty high level bjj guy he's plenty of submissions tons of control time what do you what is this bullshit because i'm 40 uh jim miller's 40 i've been saying that i think he said 39 are you sure he's 40 it says that he just turned 40 like this week because it said 39 on the top this week uh in august <laughs> anyway uh, he's evolving. He started as a grappler. He is now full blown has legitimate striking. He is finishing people on their feet. He found power. He found speed. He is coming off of a win over Gabriel Benitez where arguably Jim Miller looked better at 39 or 37 or whatever the hell it is than he did in his twenties. I don't know why Bobby Green is such a tremendous favorite. I genuinely don't know why you're going to make that dumbass face. And then we're going to fight. And people are going to say, why are they? They're just going to keep fighting. The show's going to fall. They're going to break up because they fight. And we might because he does get under my skin. And sometimes I do just want to burn this whole well, thing don't down. Don't be so fucking stupid sometimes. I would love to hear why Bobby Green, in your mind, should be a two to one favorite at 37 years old, coming off of a vicious knockout, two knockouts in his last four fights. Please, I will pass the baton. And like that girl in that TikTok where she was screaming, give me the fucking baton. You see that TikTok? Uh, I don't waste my time with TikTok. I'm, I'm constantly doing UFC research for, for the people mm. and constantly wor watching fights. And it kind of it kind of shows in this breakdown that you just really didn't work as hard as he could have <laughs> in, in researching both of these fights. Because Bobby Green is probably five times the fighter Jim Miller is. And that's no disrespect to Jim Miller. Bobby Green in his prime was a, a nearly a title contender. That is very, very good. Jim Miller is a, a gritty guy. He's a tough guy. He's got decent power, decent wrestling. But as a fighter... Bobby Green is a better fighter. He's a much better striker. But Jim Miller is not going to be able to take down Bobby Green. Bobby Green's got a very good wrestling acumen. <laughs> acumen. <laughs> Didn't I say that before the stream? I didn't know the word. What's the it word? It wasn't acumen. acumen. No, you you said... Um... <laughs> 
I forget what the word was, but it was multiple it was syllables, and yeah, you was, could not get it out. Nah, I couldn't get it out. But he's got <laughs> he's got good wrestling chops, and uh, even offensive <laughs> wrestling if he wants to use it. Obviously, Bobby Green knows he's not going to use his offensive wrestling. He doesn't want to be boring. But um, aside from a, a weird knockout, which could happen, but if you're if you just bet on a weird knockout, you should bet on every underdog on every single fight because there's always an opportunity for a knockout. But I mean, this is not Jalen Turner. I mean, this is not even Drew Dober who ended up catching him. This is Jim Miller. He's going to be a little bit slower. He's going to be a little telegraphed. I mean, he lost to – we just saw Alex Hernandez kind of get smoked again. He lost – I mean, he was losing Alex Hernandez, you know, just a, just a couple of years ago. So, I, I have all the respect in the world for Jim Miller. 2024 started with the Jim Miller Lock of the Week, and that's what set us on this very successful trend of Lock of the Week up units. We want picks.com $10 a month. Um, but Bob Green's a better striker. That's all it could, should, could come, should come down to. Obviously, you know, a, a chin is a chin. A win is a win. You know, I can't but, wait to see if you could. Uh, you couldn't do it. I was like, is there going to be a third a third line in that, Ryan? I actually looked at you, and the, honestly, the, the thing I was about to say, and the reason I didn't say anything was I was just going to randomly be like, a boner is a boner. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the path I stopped, but you got it out of me anyway. I stopped. I said, oh, well, UFC 300, we got to keep it professional. Class it up. Class <laughs> it up. Class, class, class. <laughs> well, I also pick Bobby Green to win the fight, but the point I was making is he's not – the two to one favorite. He should not be minus 175. Ultimately, I picked him because just razor thin, he's got good takedown defense and he's the better striker. That's it. I mean, that's just what it comes down to. But minus 175 is crazy. The guy, somebody commented Bobby so Green died just, in his last fight. You just said that he, he the can odds defend are the wide. takedowns. And, no, you said he can defend the takedowns and he's the better striker. That's a two to one favorite if I've ever heard one. No, it's not, the guy was... He By was Jalen floating. Turner. He was floating. If they had one of those crazy slow motion hey, cameras, hey, his hey, soul hey, was hey. floating out of his body up to the heavens. Music was playing, hey. and then he got sucked back in. They be, they hey. sucked him back into life. Okay, I respect your he point of view. He barely made it through that fight. I respect you as an analyst, and I don't need. We don't need to be yelling. That's I the only you. way I know how hey. to communicate. Hey, hey, look at me. Hey, I love you, buddy. That's the only way I know how to communicate. It's not your fault. That's from uh, Goodwill Hunting. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Just hugging him. It's not your fault. Anyway, back didn't on topic. Back. Yeah, didn't say it back. That's a little weird. Um, Bobby Green, my pick. Again, insanely slow. Two fights opening up this card. Two insanely close fights with some very wide odds, in my opinion. I think both of these fights, one of these underdogs are going to win, and one of these underdogs is going to pay out quite nicely. Are you going to spend $8,600 on Bobby Green? Nah. Yeah, because he's not going to finish Jimmy. James, he's not going to finish James. <laughs> yeah, just jinxed it. Sorry, James. 76. For Jim Miller, probably not as well, because his rest, if his wrestling was a little better and you could rely on him to shoot takedowns, then James Miller would be worth it. But he doesn't shoot. And the takedowns aren't that good when he does. So he is probably going to strike a little too long. Probably just be a touch slower, get pieced up a little bit. But Bobby Green was losing, if we back up a couple of fights, Bobby Green was losing to Tony Ferguson. He was getting touched up by Tony. And then he pulled off a submission. So we want picks.com. Click become a member. It's $10 for an entire month's worth of access. There are no tiers there's no weird, the bets are this much, the DFS is this much, but if you combine it, none of that bullshit. It's $10 for a full-blown interactive custom website with every single pick, bet, round line, lean, and tool you could ever want or need. Heading into fight week, we want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. Couple of super chatter root skis. We got Angel trolling me, saying he got his boxes ready. Let's open some packs live. We want picks, couple of goat emojis. I'll send best you a in the link business. on hell so you can join. We appreciate you, Angel. We appreciate the money, but there will be no more card opening. The public has spoken. Like four of you like when Jacob opens the cards. Everybody else absolutely hates it. Joey T has been a member, not a premium member, but a, well, he has been a premium member since day one, but this is YouTube membership for 35 months. UFC 300 is finally here. Smash the likes, you flugers. And then... Dollar ninety nine from Bookie Bully Jakey ten nine Bobby Moneyline. Yo Bookie, did you leave the Discord? He left the Discord. We miss Oof. you in there already. 
Um, I appreciate that, Dollar Ninety Nine. And look, this is uh, this is what everyone's getting custom shorts. So Bobby said he wants the, he wants the what is shorts. it? <laughs> Fucking red bandana shorts. Oh, that's what they are. It's like a uh, yeah. Like that's the funny. Bloods and the Crips, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some yeah. blood shorts. There are. There. They I go. couldn't tell if it was like it looked like looked like cherry tomatoes. That's what. He said so Bryce got his. Sean got his. I need mine. <laughs> so funny. That's King. what he went with. That's so King funny. Is so funny. Well, he had that viral moment. So here's a quick Bobby Green story. He had that moment where he, like Mackenzie Dern, he was in the broadcast booth doing the weigh-in show. Mackenzie Dern was looking good, getting on a scale. And Bobby Green's like, ooh, damn. And then did you hear how Mackenzie Dern's husband tried to lure Bobby Green into like a, a fight? He tried to like surprise him and attack him. Really? I don't. Yeah, that you can read the whole story online, but basically, Mackenzie Dern's husband, after watching Bobby Green Boyfriend. go, damn, no, they aren't they married? She's got I think they're divorce. married. I think she's with somebody else, but she's got. Oh, I thought she. Divorce. All right, fine. Yeah, you're right. It's the new person. He, who's also her coach, funny how that always happens. He was texting Bobby Green and was like, "Meet me here. Meet me here." Like, be just being all weird about it, and then Bobby Green's like, "No." Nah. He was texting Bobby saying, "Okay, let me back up." Now I remember. Bobby Green had Mackenzie Dern's UFC phone number. Shut stream. up. Shut up. Bobby Green had Mackenzie Dern's phone number. Then Mackenzie Dern's boyfriend is messaging her, him, pretending to be her. Hey, Bobby, this is Mackenzie. Use this number instead. Meet me here. You want to meet up? And was being like aggressive. Like, let's meet up right now. And he's like, no, I'm doing shit. Like, I'll meet up later. No, it has to be take right now easy, over girl. here. You'll get your turn. And then <laughs> I can see Bobby being like, take it easy, <laughs> Mackenzie. I can, I can try to work you in. I fucking love Bobby, dude. Well, and then he, I forget how he found out. He found out it was his phone number. So he was like, this dude was like trying to, trying to jump me. It's, kind, it's actually kind of a wild story. It is kind of a wild story. Yeah, see, I got there. It took me a minute. I got there. A couple more Super Chats. Four ninety nine from Dr. Y. What about a silent Minty in the corner opening packs? Just a foot she cam on just, Minty while she opens cards. Just a what did you say? Uh, they have requested a foot cam in the past as well. If you want to run that buyer. Um, and the Minty he's talking about is Minty Betts from ESPN. Minty from Betts. the broadcast. She also is part of this channel, and every single Friday, Minty puts out a weigh-in recap video. You don't need to watch two hours worth of weigh-ins. Minty will. And for We Want Picks, she will recap the weigh-ins, let you know who made weight, who missed weight, who looked good, who looked like shit, and give you all of those bullet points. So that's who he is talking about. We also got a four ninety nine from New York Rental. You guys have to pick. <laughs> Would you smash Josiane Nunes or Verna Jandaroba and why? Oh, I'd go Nunes because I think she's a little top-heavy, isn't she? Right, she's got she a little she'll fill out a bra. No, fat tees. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you doing okay, man? Noons, it is. You don't even need to. That, it wasn't I mean, even I'll a take hard choice. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not yeah. Sure, you know, <laughs> I can get them both. I get them both. Uh, and Dennis K, Jacob, let's get the money this week. Thank you, Dennis K. That's my guy, Denise. All right, let's move on. Speaking right, of on. absolute. No, don't go on this Beautiful. stupid rant again. It's not a stupid Listen, rant. No, no, I agree. It, Jacob's whole, this is not a good picture for this you is to not, make your yeah, case. This is not, yeah, this is a bad one to make this case. That's why I'm looking at my phone real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second. Give me just a second here. Jessica Andrade looks like she is uh, hot as shit. Justin Bieber. She's not hot. She's got a she pretty She is hot. Face. Yes, she looks, you just said she looks like Justin Bieber, who is hot. Smash Norma or Mackenzie? Ooh. That's a good one. Can you get that off the screen, please? Well, that's she a, has a that's beautiful a, smile. That's a that's a beautiful boy eyes, and I think it was Minty was like, I wonder what she looked like with long hair. Well, I want to <laughs> sit down for this one. Look these pictures. Here you go. Yeah, let me work on it. Hurry up, dude! Now, it is UFC 300. Now the time that we're wasting. I mean, you see that in the gym. Every, every single person in here, you see that is like, she's fucking hot as shit. You see that girl in the gym? Every single guy in here thinks she is hot as shit. So. Okay. Well, you can get all the goods on her OnlyFans. Full close-up zoom-ins of every single part. Here's the question to you. Christian Baller, Dollar 99 Norma, or Mackenzie? Um, you know. 
don't know. Maybe Gene Matsumoto. I would go. Uh, I think well, Norma is is the prettier of the two women. Well, you're married, but I wouldn't I so. wouldn't pick either one because I am um, happily married. Next up at UFC three hundred, we have Jessica Andrade taking on Marina Rodriguez. Jessica Andrade is twenty five and twelve in her career. A former world champion. Two and three in her last five. She is coming off that knockout win over Mackenzie Dern, which bucked a three-fight skid. She's taking on Marina Rodriguez, 17 and three in her entire career. Three and two in her last five, coming off that TKO win over the Karate Hati. I mentioned Jessica Andrade. What the that's fuck the, was that? That's the dog. Jesus Dude. Christ, that was Sorry. so loud in my headset. I didn't know what the fuck was. I thought somebody was in my house. He's me- He was messing with Jesus the doorstop. Christ. UFC 300, Angelo. God. I have him locked in here so he doesn't fight and scream with the other dog outside. Keep it going with the breakdown. Jessica Andrade, former world champion. She's a contender at multiple weight classes. She has had wild success at 115 pounds. She's had wild success at 125 pounds. She's fought some of the best women on planet Earth. She's almost never the more skilled fighter in the cage. Skill for skill, she's not typically at the top of that scale. But she is strong. She is powerful. She is tough. And she can be a very effective bully. She will move forward, get in your face, push you around, drag you to the ground. She literally won the belt by picking up Rose Namajunas and spiking her on her head. And she became the world champion. Just sheer brute force and power. She is what Trevor Peak aspires to be. She's taken on Marina Rodriguez. Marina Rodriguez, very good, clean boxer. She's got good speed, good power. She has raw one-punch power for this weight class. Takedown defense is just okay. She is very tall, and she uses that length well to stay at range and keep fights technical. Marina is a complete fighter. She can grind out a win or she can finish some people. She is durable, and she did just finish the karate hottie in a fight that she looked very, very good. Another fight where I'm surprised at the dog situation. I am surprised that Marina Rodriguez, who is the much better fighter, is the underdog here. She's got better skills. Her boxing is going to be cleaner. Her striking is going to be cleaner. She's going to have better footwork, better technique on the outside. She will not be stronger. She just won't be stronger. But if she can fight a technical fight, stay on the outside, not get pushed against the cage, not get bullied, Marina can win this fight. And I'm picking Marina to win this fight. I think that's what happens. I think we have seen that Jessica Andrade can hit you if you're hittable. But if you're not hittable, Jessica Andrade can struggle with technique and Marina Rodriguez just has too good of technique here. I think Marina's going to win. What do you think, Jakey Bombalotes? Yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree. You know, it's it's tough. Damn it, Angelo. And I talk about this all the time, but I sit here today, looking at two beautiful. The way you said, I sit here today, like you're about to, like you're doing a sermon. We're just we're just listening to the Riz sermon right now. Every breakdown I do is basically a sermon. It's gospel. Okay. And people yeah, let's take see. it to the fucking <laughs> yeah, yeah, bank. Yeah. I, I sit here before you today, Angelo, as a man, and as a man that really loves Brazil and the Brazilian culture, and I sit here as a man <laughs> looking at these two beautiful Brazilian women, and it pain, honestly, honest to God, it pains me to have to pick, you know, it, but I'm going to do it. But I just want to let you know there's no bias in this one because I I, I am up against the wall here between a, a, a rock and a hard thing. And and it, to pick between these women is, is going to be a very difficult thing to do. But I, I, I agree. I think Marina is the better fighter. And I've tried to play this game. And I tried to play a game in Marina's last fight. Verna took Marina down, right? So I said, oh. Oh, I know somebody that's got some decent takedowns. The Karate Hottie. Michelle Watterson, she's got some <laughs> she good decent beat her takedowns. Ass. Yeah, she's got some <laughs> decent takedowns. I think maybe she can do that too. Let me pick Michelle Watterson. That didn't work. That that did not work. That was very bad. That was a bad situation. <laughs> and people are like giving Andrade all this credit. Like Andrade is back and she's the old Andrade. She beat this shit out of who? Mackenzie Dern. Yeah, Mackenzie Dern. I mean, anybody is beating the shit out of Mackenzie Durham for whatever reason. I mean, she's just gone <laughs> backwards with her striking. But it, that, that's not like a, a very impressive win to me. 
You know, and Marina's coming off this great win against a, a very tough girl and just beat the absolute shit out of her. She's going to be the better striker, much cleaner striker, good footwork to avoid those blitz ins from Andrade. And as good as a, a, a tough bully type girl that Andrade is, her entries on her takedowns and stuff are not that great. I mean, it's just kind of lunging in, trying to press you in, and the footwork should be there for Marina. And on those, you know, step offs, then you have those shots too she can hit people with. I think she can definitely wear down a girl like Jessica Andrade, who's going to keep moving forward, but walking straight in into shots, basically, in my opinion. So, I agree with you here. I, I think Marina has the opportunity to kind of style on Jessica Andrade. Obviously, if Andrade gets her hands on her, gets her to the ground, it's going to be a bad situation for Marina, but I think there's some decent value in the underdog. Yeah, I, uh, we're aligned here. I think most people are, because even though Marina Rodriguez is the dog, it opened dead even, and to go from minus 110 to minus 137 isn't crazy. That's not a ton of movement. And I imagine a lot of that movement is because people are like, well... This is at 100, you know, this is at the right weight class for Jessica Andrade. This is the good weight class for her. She's not going to be too small. Like, this This is the weight class. This is where she should be. So, we'll see what happens in this fight. I don't think, this is this is a very rare situation where DraftKings has given you exactly dead even odds. You, you see this maybe once a year where you get 8,100 and 8,100. You usually get 8,000 and 82. This is a very rare situation to see this. So, that's how split even the DraftKings salary makers are. I'm on the Marina Rodriguez side, but I don't think she scores that well. I don't think she's going to finish Jessica Andrade because even though she's been finished plenty of times, it's by heavy grapplers. She gets taken down, she gets beat up, and that's sort of the end of it. Marina Rodriguez is not that. Yes, sir. I just had a, uh, a, a, a epiphany of, oh. of a sorts. I think that this is very similar to the Garbrandt figgy fight with Marina being Garbrandt, but doesn't have the chin issues as Garbrandt. And Jessica not being the, quite the skill level of Figgy, but that brawling type of style wants to get physical on the ground. And, uh, you know, you really liked Cody in that. And I think this is a better version of that. Marina, the be a non-chinny, better striker in this matchup uh, against somebody that doesn't really have good takedowns and stuff. So that's a comparison I would make. And I like Marina here better the than difference, Cody, though. The difference to me, though, is that um, Figgy's going up 10 pounds in weight. And I think that's going to be a factor here. In that fight, where this one, Jessica's probably going to be the stronger fighter. So, but good job with the analogy. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Um, okay. Anyway, I just want. Are say you going to put either one of them in your DraftKings lineup? Yeah, despite the negativity you keep showing me, I, I hope you have a, a great rest of the stream, and I hope that inside that you're happy. Uh, I am actually quite happy. Uh, and you will be happy to know that premium membership continues to get better, but the price has never changed. It's only $10 a month. We have over 3,000, well over 3,000 happy premium members. Join the club. $10 for an entire month. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It is quite literally the best, most successful service in this space offering what we offer. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. We do have a, it's not a super chat, but somebody said, or Ken said, Angel, did you see Hill posted you? And I did. Jamal oh, Hill God. had a montage. It wasn't just me. It was a montage of people picking Glover Teixeira to beat him. And uh, I guess he had his team edit it and he posted it. And it's me saying, um, who took down Hill six times? Somebody took down Hill six times. And I was like, if this guy took down Hill six times, Glover's going to take down Hill, no problem. And uh, obviously that's not how that fight went, so... Whoopsie daisy. We want an MMA fight between y'all at a hundred. We already fought Christian. Jacob and I have already fought and there's a video of it on this channel. So you got it at 23,000 subscribers. We didn't even need to wait to a hundred. I'm happy to run it back though, which tells you exactly how the first time it went. Next up at UFC 300, we have the latest addition to the card. The newest fight added to this card is Jalen Turner taking on Hinato Moicano. Jalen Turner, 14 and 7 overall, 3 and 2 in his last five. He is coming off that knockout win over Bobby Green. He's taking on Hinato Moicano, 18 and 5 overall, 4 and 1 in his last five. He's coming off that decision win over Andrew Dober. And this is an interesting fight because Jalen Turner 
is a nasty striker. He's very long. He's very tall. He uses that well. He's got plenty of power, good footwork. He can move forward while counter-striking at the exact same time. He's got laser pinpoint accuracy and true one-punch knockout power. He also has plenty of submissions. Three of his last five wins are by submission. And a lot of that, he snatches things up and scrambles and he seizes opportunities. Jalen Turner's very well-rounded guy. The problem, though, Jalen Turner has quite literally never won a decision. Never won a decision. And that does concern me here because Hinato Moikano, while he has been knocked out plenty of times, he is a pretty durable guy. He started his career as a grappler, came forward, decent takedowns, nothing fantastic, but decent takedowns and very, very good, very dangerous jujitsu. Over the years, he has evolved his striking. He doesn't really have any power at all, but he does good technical striking where he can hang at least on the technique side. The power side, it's just not there. He has shown us in multiple fights that he doesn't even need a takedown to get a submission like against Brad Riddell. He does not shoot in takedowns. He doesn't really create scrambles. But he is a guy that will come forward, take his punishment, and try to win that fight. I do think Jalen Turner wins this fight. I think Jalen Turner is going to be too fast. I think he's going to hit too hard. My one and only concern is that Jalen Turner has never won a decision. If he starts to fade and Moicano starts to take over, it could be an annoying, frustrating fight to watch. With that being said, Hanano Moicano only beat Drew Dober because Drew Dober made a mistake. And he capitalized on it, so good for him. So I do think this is a bit of a mismatch, even if you look at Jalen Turner's losses. I mean, they're, they're pretty quality losses in good back-and-forth fights. I think Jalen Turner... Far better striker, way too much power, should be long enough and control the distance enough and touch up Moicano enough on his way in to keep this fight standing and win this fight. Jalen Turner is going to be the pick, but I do hope he gets him out of there early so I don't have to bite my nails wondering if he can win his first ever decision. What do you think, Jakey boy? There's your tarantula autographed card. What do you think, Jakey Bombalotes? I got the card in. I got the, I got a card in, everyone. You there did. you go, the tarantula. That's actually an awesome card with an awesome... Uh, Tarantula is a cool signature, yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I agree. J Jalen Turner is, he, I mean, this dude's fucking good. And, and I tried to m not make a case for Bobby Green in the last fight. I think a lot, everyone was pretty much on Jalen Turner. But I said, I don't know if he's going to finish a guy like Bobby Green because I don't I don't know if I see, like, killer instinct in Jalen Turner. I, and that's, this was me talking more before his last fight. Like, he he has all these finishes, but it just seems like he's just like a— just a very easygoing, kind of casual type of fighter, and I just wish I could see that next level of fire. And then all of a sudden, I saw him knock Bobby Green down and then decide, I think I want to fucking kill this guy on the ground. So I saw that killer instinct that I love. This is this should be a, a, a cut and dry fight. This should be, a, a, I don't want to say an easy fight for Jalen Turner, but his striking abilities is just going to be so dominant against a guy like Morcano. Morcano came in against Drew Dober and needed every second of control time to win that fight because he was such a liability on the feet at times in that fight he is a tough dude but against Jalen Turner it doesn't sometimes it doesn't matter how fucking tough you are this guy hits really really hard and even on the ground he, he is a dangerous guy I'm not saying he should grapple with a guy like Moikana if Moikana ends up in a scramble gets his back or something it's it's probably not gonna be a good situation but he knows what he's doing on the ground he can survive if he gets taken down I don't think he's gonna get taken down though and he's just gonna be, use that length that distance and, and, and snipe a guy that really kind of stays on the center line in the striking so I, I like Jalen Turner here um you know Moikana is always gonna be live if it goes to the ground but uh, I don't I don't see it there and on the feet I think he's I think he's in trouble yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting because Jalen Turner should be the far better fighter here. And this comment stuck out. 14-7, and seven, he seems so much better than his record. That is exactly what I think every time I see Jalen Turner's record. I agree. Seven losses is a lot because when you watch him fight, you're like, this guy is freaking good. And you don't get those vibes from Hanato Moicano. Hanato's been, he's more popular now than he's ever been before. He worked his way in the UFC 300 card because he played his post-fight interview perfectly. And good for him. I mean, fighting, will you will not be able to retire off the money you make fighting unless you're the, like, 1%. Everybody else has to build another career for themselves, and that's what Hanato is doing, so good for him. Uh, he'll get a nice bag here. He's built a nice little fan base. He got the money nickname, but uh, I just don't think it's going to be enough. $8,900 in DraftKings for Jalen Turner. If he wins, he will cover that because Jalen Turner finishes people and puts up some very real numbers. Are you going to put him in your lineup, Jakey Boy? Yeah, I think that might be one of the better value, $8,900 values uh, on the card, honestly.
I uh, complete. Oop, I complete. I meant to unstar that. I'm not pinning that, Christian. Um, I think we're aligned on this one. And if you want to align yourself with some of the best picks, tools, bets, and stuff in the game, go to wewantpicks.com. Click become a member at the top. It's only ten dollars for an entire month. There are other services out there. We are not the only ones. We are the ones though who gave you the most robust offering. You're gonna go find other people. Ninety nine percent. It's a Patreon. Then there's a, a handful of people that have taken the time to build a website. Most of them load slow and they suck. And then most of them have, here's my betting stuff, $10. Here's my DFS stuff, $20. But if you put it to, no games, no bullshit. This sport is tricky enough. We appreciate the fans and we are in the volume business. Well over 3,000 members, $10 for an entire month's worth of access. Not just this card, but every card in that month. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. Someone asked when I'm fighting Artem. I would. Oh, you'd smoke Artem. Dude, oh, every week, and Artem is watching, every fucking good. week, Artem has, oh, I, I'm I'm unwell. I'm, I'm not going to be able to do my article this week. I'm unwell. Oh, I'm moving flats, Angelo. Oh, I have to study for my finals and whatever Kiwi terms they use for all these things. He's always got some bullshit going. Oh, I can't. You know what the last excuse was? And you're watching Artem, so you better either be laughing or crying. Those are the only two acceptable reactions. The last time... Artem sent me a message. It was like, I'm not going to be able to, to write the article. I have a Frisbee golf tournament. I have a Frisbee. I made it to the finals of the Frisbee golf tournament. That's your boy. That's not me. That's what not a me. fucking joke, dude. Frolf. Artem Frolf. Uh, Mr. T. Keeds. Oh, speak of the devil. We know what's going on here. Yeah. So he, he said be, I'd look uh, good with nipple piercings. I'd be... 15 years younger. I had a nipple piercing. Only one, not both. I'm not a freak. I had uh, one single nipple pierced. I got it pierced on the Jersey Shore when I was uh, 19. Damn it, I keep... When I was 19 years old. And um, then my Showed immigrant off. mother... My Stick immigrant your mother... The hole. <laughs> it's gone. My immigrant mother ripped it out in the kitchen. I was with my friend in the kitchen and he thought he would be funny and he pulled up my shirt and he goes, look, to show my mom and my mom just looked at me and goes, boom, and just ripped it out. So I bet that you That's how that, that went. Pierced. I bet you kept that thing pierced secretly. I bet you could still It's just, I just have a, a 40-year-old man with two young daughters and a pierced nipple well, living in the burbs. That would be a wild my pool ears day. Are still still uh, pierced? How do you know? When was the last time you put something in there? Uh, like last week. You just wore earrings last week? Like it was fucking no, 2006? I just, I just threw them in. Sometimes, studs? Yeah. Studs sometimes from Claire's? It's, sometimes you Claire's in, studs? Tuck, uh, <laughs> tuck the sack back, stare in the mirror. <laughs> the little fruit basket? Little fruit basket action? Angelo, if you guys don't know what a I mean, fruit basket on, is... Angelo... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to explain a fruit basket. I mean, if you guys ask, maybe I will, but I'm not going to explain that right now. Next up, at UFC 300, we have Sadiq Youssef taking on Diego Lopez. This is another very good fight. Sadiq Youssef coming off of a main event, taking on Diego Lopez, one of the most surging, most surging doesn't work, which is why I paused. I tried to tried to pivot, couldn't figure it out. One of the more surging, nope. We have a surging prospect in Diego Lopez coming off of a handful of quality wins in the UFC. Sadiq Youssef, 13-3 and three in the entirety of his career. 3-2 and two in his last five. He is coming off that decision loss to Edson Barboza in his first ever main event. He's taking on Diego Lopez. And it is Lopez and not Lopes. He's 23 and 6 overall. Ford won in his last five, coming off his second UFC stoppage win. This is, I'm not going to say this is, this should be a clash of the styles. This should be striker versus grappler, but it won't be because Diego Lopez doesn't grapple offensively as much as he should. But we got Sadiq Youssef, powerful. Fast, accurate striker. Sadiq Youssef is very, very good. He's a fantastic striker with decent power, incredible speed. He has a wide variety of attacks. He's 7-2 and two in the UFC. He has outstruck every single opponent, including Arnold Allen and Edison Barbosa in those losses. Edison Barbosa's three takedowns were probably the difference in that fight. He landed more strikes, and he looked pretty good striking with one of the best strikers in that division. They did drop each other in that fight, so we got to see Sadiq work his way through a little bit of adversity. He's taking on Diego Lopez. 
He's a very dangerous grappler. He's coaching some of the best fighters in Mexico. He is their MMA coach and their jiu-jitsu coach. And grappling-wise, technique-wise, it's all there. And even in his hands, he's got very good power. But his striking technique, the raw technique, isn't quite there yet. But he does have power. He enjoys fighting. He likes to be funny. He likes to come forward. He wants to swing wild. And it worked against Pat Sabatini. It worked against Gavin Tucker. It wasn't quite what happened against Gavin Tucker. But those things work. The only thing that worries me when you're breaking down a Diego Lopez fight is he doesn't really shoot offensive takedowns. He's perfectly happy to be taken down, but he doesn't shoot offensive takedowns. His striking can be clean. He'll move forward. He'll be busy. If you do something, he'll capitalize on a mistake, but you can't trust them to come in here and say, you know what? Sadiq's going to be faster than me. He's going to be the better striker. I need to wrestle. You can't trust him to do that. So I don't think he will do that. And I think he's going to get pieced up. I am going to pick Sadiq Youssef here, not the most... Oh, my God, dude. Oh, my God, man. So, let me give you Jacob's breakdown here. Jacob thinks all of those women at that Lobo gym are attractive, and because he thinks those women are attractive and because he he wants some interactions from them, and he'll tell you which ones follow him on Instagram. I think Loopy does. So, because he has an avenue into the gym and... Uh, has pictures of them on his walls in his single bedroom apartment. He is now going to pick everybody that's ever come out of that gym and make him sound amazing. So let's all sit and let Jacob flirt with the women at the Lobo gym vicariously through their coach, Diego Lopez. Go ahead, Jacob. Let us know how this goes. Yeah, Diego Lupe, uh, Lupus, Diego. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Lupe okay, on the mind. okay. Lupe yeah. on the mind. <laughs> Diego Lopez is, uh, yeah, what a great dude, huh? I mean, at, at, <laughs> at, Lo, at Lobo, you know, with Grasso, with uh, Aldana, with Lupe, with a lot of those girls, and uh, does a great job <laughs> with them. I mean, jujitsu coach, as you mentioned. Uh, obviously, I think it's Grasso's father who's actually like the actual, or her, her uncle is actually the, the head coach and the striking coach, but Diego is definitely involved with the game planning stuff like that does a great job in this fight i worry angelo and that's that's the god honest truth i love i love diego lopez i i think he's more than capable of winning this fight in the striking especially on the ground and listen to me now everyone he is my pick i put money on him i i, I trust him to that effect but there is in the back of my mind a worry because diego lopez doesn't give a fuck Four more lock of the week. I know my lock of the week's very, very well. This guy does not give a fuck. The other thing he does not give a fuck about is shooting takedowns like Angelo said, <laughs> being offensive with that grappling. He wants to knock out Sadiq Youssef. He can probably knock out or at least hurt Sadiq Youssef. But in those exchanges, his defensive striking is not very good. He can get hit. He can get dropped. And he's kind of like a, uh, like a Charles Oliveira. To where it's, it's he's going to get dropped and he's going to be, you know, okay, let's play this ground game and try to survive. But this is a very dangerous thing to play against Sadiq because Sadiq has shown that he can be low volume. And if you just kind of point fight him, if and Diego's not going to do this. I know he's not going to do this. But if he comes in and just point fights Sadiq, eventually Sadiq will, will get a little bit too aggressive. Then he let him make the mistake, Diego. Don't get in, don't get way too aggressive, get in the pocket, throw an extended combination, and all of a sudden, uh-oh, now you're on the ground. You just stay out of danger. Let's let's extend this fight a little bit. And then let's try to mix in some wrestling. Or if you're going to pressure, be very smart pressure. And maybe you can draw out a takedown from Sadiq. Because if Sadiq doesn't really like the pressure, instead of brawling out of it and worry about getting knocked out, he literally might shoot a takedown. For no guy. I mean, he, Sadiq, you shouldn't, you shouldn't shoot a takedown. <laughs> but he could, right? Because you can take Diego down. And you can. We've seen people stay safe-ish in, those, in, in that regard. So my pick is Diego. I do worry if he comes in and just goes gangbusters trying to knock out Sadiq because Sadiq can no, knock out anybody. But I, I got to trust Diego. He's a tough dude. I think he gets in and makes it nasty. Hopefully he finds a grappling exchange. Um, but I, I got to go Diego. He, he just he, It just feels like, I mean, dream, believe. <laughs> um can't read backwards nope and hammock. make it happen oh hammock yeah. and make it happen yeah. Diego's the pick, baby. Uh, anybody was wondering what was going on there that is what's tattooed directly across diego lopez's 
Chest, are you going to trust your boy at $8,500? Yeah, I think I think this one's over quick. You know, I, I, a lot it of people kind of like the uh, the over or whatever it is. I I think this one's gonna be over quick. Diego's gonna get in his face, and we're gonna see what happens. <laughs> and I hope it's, I hope it's Diego. <laughs> uh, if Sadiq had a little more power, because he does tend to be, he does have power. He's got some knockouts in the UFC, but he, the power is more speed. He's just so lightning fast, and then it's like, whoa, catches you off guard. Um, if there was a touch more, just raw hips punching power. I'd be all over him, but you know, I, I do think this is a perfect fight for both of them. We're gonna find out where Sadiq is in the in the hierarchy, and we're gonna find out how good of a prospect Diego Lopez actually is. Because as UFC debut, we kind of got you know taken down and wet blanketed from Mosvar Evelev, mm. and since then he's looked spectacular. So I am on the Sadiq side. And I think the striking is gonna matter more here because we know Diego's not gonna shoot takedowns. What was that? Yeah, and, and in theory, Sadiq is a great opponent for Diego because Sadiq's not going to get in his face and, and be no, like he's this a crazy pressure striker. striker. Yeah. And if you're Diego Lopes, I, I would – it's ones and twos. That's all you need. Don't throw extended combinations because that's where you're going to get caught. But if you just throw ones and twos, you're going to be able to stay safe. You're going to be able to land and maybe land something of effect and then work in the grappling. But, yeah. Yeah, it should be uh, – this should be a really fun fight as our moth fight. Moth. Damn it. Mm. I was, I've been doing so well, dude. I, that was only my second blunder. Most fights on this card. But you can unlock bets for all of them. Picks for all of them. Tools for every single fight on this card and every other fight in the month. And not in the month like the month of April. A 30-day month. If you sign up on April, whatever the hell today is, the 9th, you will have full access Till May 9th. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It is only freaking $10 a month. And as Jacob always says, you're going to spend $10 on some dumbass parlay with 17 legs. It's going to miss anyway. You might as well put that money to good use. It's a phenomenal way to support us and keep the lights on. There are over 3,000, well over 3,000 of you doing that. We appreciate all of you. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. Junior Rank says... Uncle Ange with the returning lisp. It's it's fighting its way back. It is clawing its way back in. And, I'm, and uh, yeah, I don't want to put out your business too much, but I want to interject there and say that Angelo is working on it. I mean, you're at those classes. Yeah, speech pathologist. Four yeah. or five times a week, something like that. You know, three hours every single night. And uh, they're really doing a number on them, and, and we're praying for them. Um, the, the tongue exercises. Uh, I am training. Say what now? The Three days a week. We have a $5 super chat from Ben M. What up, fellas? Can y'all give a shout to my wife? I think I can say that. Nidia. <laughs> She's watching the channel with me right now. Uh, I read these very thoroughly now. <laughs> like, we've been... The worst one I ever got was Jacob and I, the old school fans. We appreciate you, Ben. And shout out Nidia. The uh, the worst one that I ever got, I'm not nearly as bad as uh, Michael Bisping. He'll read anything. He's freaking Ron Burgundy. Uh, Jacob and I were live streaming in my old house, one of our very first live streams ever. We were just watching the fights together, reacting. The channel wasn't nearly as big as it is now, but there were some people in there hanging out. And somebody's like, I love you guys. Can you give me a shout out? And it was Ice Wallow C-O-M-E. So I just wrote, oh, shout out. I swallow cum. I was like, damn it. So it did not go well for me. Did not go well for me. Next up, at UFC 300, we have the only UFC debut on the card, Kayla Harrison. And she is taking on former UFC champion, Holly Holm. This is one of the more controversial fights on this card. And I got to be honest with you. I think most people are far over complicating this fight. We have 42-year-old Holly Holm, 15 and 6 overall. 3-1 one and 1 in her last five. She is coming off the overturned submission loss to Myra Bueno Silva. She was submitted standing with a ninja choke. But that fight was overturned to a no contest because Myra Bueno Silva had some Ritalin in her system. She's taking on Kayla Harrison. It's a new name to most of you. And that's because she's coming over from the PFL. She's 16 and one in her career, four and one in her last five, and she's making her UFC debut. We'll start on the Kayla Harrison side. Not only is this her UFC debut, but she is far more than Hot just that. Shit. She, oh. she is far more 
than a PFL fighter who's moving over to the UFC. She is a two-time Olympic gold medalist judoka. Judoka is somebody who practices judo. She is literally the greatest American judoka of all time. It is not even close. There is nobody from America that has anywhere near the credentials or the accolades that she has practicing judo, male or female. She is absolutely one of the best that has ever done it. Two different Olympic gold medals, a whole myriad of world titles, Pan American titles, and things like that. She is absolutely tremendous. She won those Olympic gold medals at like 170 pounds. She was fighting in the PFL at 155 pounds. Her only loss in the PFL was to Pacheco, who she had already beaten. And it felt like she did not look good in that fight, but that fight looked... Very much like somebody who has beaten everybody and doesn't care anymore. She has won literally millions of dollars just running through those PFL tournaments. She's got power in her hands because she's so jacked. She has incredible judo, as we know. She is basically a 2.0 version of Ronda Rousey. She's stronger. She's better at judo. She's got better hands, and her striking's not very good, but it is better than what Ronda's was, and she has power. Amanda the- Eboss would send her dumbass flying. The biggest concern in this fight is, can Kayla make the weight? I mentioned judo, Olympian, 170-something pounds. PFL, 155 pounds. The lowest we have ever seen her compete professionally was 150, 150 Do you keep pounds. you pounding your desk? Oh, you can hear that? Jesus. That is 50, I kept, I, I'm she, making I points. Thought, I was like, is there like... Oh, that's why you did that? Yeah, I was like, is there I'm making so points. somewhere? I'm like, where is that coming from? I'm like Dwight from The Office, just pounding the table to make my points. Just fucking pounding it, baby. <laughs> She's, um, <laughs> the last fight, the lowest we've ever seen her fight at was 150 pounds. That is 15 pounds heavier than what she needs to be when she fights Holly Holm. And Holly Holm, we know at this point. She's 42 years old. She is the former bantamweight champion of the world. She knocked out. Ronda Rousey to become the champion and then beat the absolute shit, the absolute shit out of what's her name, but then got submitted at the very last minute to give up her belt. Who, what's her name? The good looking one I who won Big Brother. Saying, so, oh, Damn. Misha. Misha Tate. Yeah, there it is. And then she lost her belt to Misha Tate, but beat the piss out of her. Holly Holm was a professional kickboxer who worked her way into MMA. And she uses or used to use those kickboxing techniques to manage range, keep you at distance, piece you up, use the length, use the reach, use the kicks, and do all of that. As she's gotten older, though, she has become a cage wrestler. She wants to hold you against the cage, lean on you. She basically fights exactly like Raquel Pennington. Just hold you against the cage, be as boring as possible, and slow you down. She did win the first round against Myra Buena Silva doing exactly that, and then she got choked in the second round doing exactly that. The reality is, I think Kayla Harrison stomps Holly Holm. And yeah, you can go back nine years or whatever it was when Holly beat Ronda Rousey, and she could beat Kayla with that exact same game plan. Stay as far away as possible and just hit her hard. Do not, no clinch work, no cage work, just far as hell, hit her and stay away. But Kayla has an iron chin. Holly doesn't have a ton of power. Kayla's just going to charge forward, get Holly against the cage, probably toss her to the ground or at least hold her there. Holly's not going to be able to out-cage control Kayla Harrison. Kayla Harrison runs through a 40-year-old Holly Holm, 42-year-old Holly Holm, That's why this is the matchup. They spent a ton of money on her. They want her to win. This is a big name that she can beat. Kayla Harrison is the pick. The one and only concern is the weigh-ins. So watch the way. I do have a bet on Kayla Harrison pre-weigh-ins because I'm worried that the line's going to go berserk after weigh-ins because I do think she will make weight. She is a professional, but just in case, keep an eye on that. What do you think, Jakey boy? Yeah, I think she knows. News. I think she knows what she's doing with the uh, the weight cut and the weigh in. She they 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 do test cuts and stuff. This isn't like a, a, yeah. a, a, just wing it. You know, hope we can make it. You know, especially for a big event like this. They know that she can make this weight. She's shown that she can make this weight. Um, and and maybe it's a little bit tougher because of the stresses of a fight week, right? You kind of hold on to water a little bit more um, in those type of situations because I've, I've you know I've been there, done that, right? With all these all these wrestling weight cuts, the MMA weight cuts, the Jiu Jitsu weight cuts, the Muay Thai fights, the kickboxing fights all these fights I've been in. Um, it gets a little stressful. You hold on to water yeah. a little bit more. But uh, sure. she's, she's probably going to make the weight, and you know she should be able to win this fight. You absolutely nailed it. This this is, they know what, the UFC typically knows what they're doing with matchups, right? And this is a, let's give a name, but let's make sure it's a name that we can build 
<laughs> you know, Kayla off of, right? They don't expect Kayla to lose this fight. They want her to win her UFC debut, to win her fight. So they gave her Holly Holm, who, as you mentioned, has kind of turned from this Stephen Wonderboy Thompson type striker into just kind of hold you. And if you hold a girl like Kayla, you're probably going to go down the ground. The only thing that worries me a, a, kind of a lot with Kayla is I watched that Aspen Lad fight live. And I watched that, and that was one of the first times I ever watched Kayla Harrison because I've heard all the stories. And I watched Kayla Harrison. I was like, "This is this is Kayla." I was like, "This is Kayla." I think I was in our Discord. Like, this is the this is the girl we're talking about against Aspen Lad. Aspen Lad is some. I, I actually thought that Aspen had an opportunity. Aspen Lad's to, good though. to win that. Like, relaxing. You know, she's not fucking good. <laughs> Okay. I actually thought that Aspen Ladd had an opportunity to kind of win a couple of those rounds, made some mistakes, had the back of Kayla Harrison at one point. The thing that I, I don't think a lot of people are mentioning as well is is Kayla on the ground with the with that good wrestling control as well because she got decent wrestling to go with the judo in kind of those half guard positions. PFL, guess what? No elbows, right? And th- and those are the type of situations where you could really fucking punish somebody, right? So in PFL, it's it's hard to get those punches off, and you have to rely a lot of just kind of control. Try to advance position so there you can posture up and, and strike. And she doesn't really have those abilities to kind of get the, you know, go to mount and then try to do it. So I think the elbows is going to play a little bit more of a part than people realize. I mean, that ground and pound is going to get nasty if she gets Holly down. And I think she's going to get her down. So uh, I'm going I'm going Kayla here. But I I, I watched that Aspen Lad fight live and I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I took Kayla's... Um... Because her last couple PFL performances weren't great, but she had already beaten Larissa Pacheco handily. So I just took that as you fight the same person multiple times over. She's losing interest. She literally run through the PFL twice. She just I, I just took that as didn't prepare, kind of uninterested. Almost like what happened with Amanda Nunes when she lost to the Venezuelan Vixen in their first fight. Right, just this has been too easy for too long. That's what I took that as. The Aspen Lad win, that was the last fight in her contract. She knew it was. Let me just get through this and then I'll I don't even want to say get paid because she made way more money in the PFL than she'll probably make here. But I just took those performances as that. And styles make fights. Holly Holm is 42 years old. I keep emphasizing that. I actually don't think that's that big of a deal. She doesn't fight where age matters, meaning as you get older, the first thing that goes is your speed, the second thing is your chin. Or chin, then speed, depending on weight class and gender. Holly Holm doesn't fight with either one of those things. She's just leaning on you against the cage and managing distance. Cage control is not a thing that she's going to be able to do or want to get here. So she has to stay on the outside and try to pick apart. And Kayla is just too tough, too iron jawed. She's just going to march forward or absorb whatever. So we're both on the Kayla Harrison side. I am not going to throw her in DraftKings at $9,300, though. That's you a, could that's throw a, her anywhere. I could not. She went 170 pounds you and won the Olympics. The, you could beat the shit out of Trevor Peak, but you can't beat the shit out of Kayla? Trevor Peak was trying to Indian burn somebody to get a win in the UFC. Kayla Harrison was a 170-pound two-time Olympic gold medalist in a grappling art. I imagine I get tossed. I imagine I get tossed. Maybe not. Kayla, but I imagine up, I Because I would pay... I know you're, you're pretty well load on, loaded at this point at PFL, but I would play, pay... A handsome amount of money for you to come to uh to texas and throw angela around i imagine i get to i mean 170 pounds it's not like if she was like 130 140 fine 170 pounds and she's jacked i i i, I would if if her and i wrestled i would have to shoot i couldn't tie up i would have to shoot like knee down shins just hit the shins and just stay as low as possible like i did on you i scooped up those singles pretty easily yeah, no, Jacob the Wrestler. Check out the fight video. Uh, are you going to spend the $9,300 on Kayla in DraftKings Fantasy? I will not. <laughs> Christian says, Kayla was on Impractical Jokers. I did not know that. I'll have to look that up. I love that show. You know, you want to hear... Oh, man. You know how I'm a- uh, aging at an incredible pace? I used to be called... You know the cast of Impractical Jokers, right? Everybody does? Yeah, and just a quick reference here. I haven't gone on one tangent. I'm trying to keep it professional. <laughs> I was told well, you better fucking lock down and not be, button it up. Not be and not be fit for Jacob. So if I'm just sitting here being quiet, guys, I'm letting Angela do his thing. Go ahead, let's hear this fucking story, Angela. I used to. People used to be like, "You remind me of Sal from Impractical Jokers," <laughs> and he's the he's the fat one, but good looking. He's yeah. good looking. 
<laughs> now we were on the cruise last summer. What did we they to, say? <laughs> so, and this is not a joke. Don't be a fucking weirdo about it. No, what this did is, they say? This is a God's honest truth. We were on a cruise. A couple families went on the cruise. Congratulations. And a little kid came up to me and said, are you an Impractical Santa Jokers? And I said, no. Which one did you think I was? She said, Joe. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but I'm laughing to support you. That's the fat, bald one. So Up next. If you guys could become a premium member, I might go get myself some of the Damon Jackson hair transplant. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It is only $10 for an entire month. Also, I do have hair and you can see all of it on my fight foods vlog. I will be doing one for UFC 300. Next up. Ooh. Fresh, fresh, at UFC fresh 300. I like that. We have a, yeah, he's got a little smirk. He looks yeah, like a Neutrogena like commercial. Hey, he looks like he's, he's glowing. Baby yeah. eyes. Yeah, he's Jesus. That literally Christ. is like a Neutrogena commercial Jesus face. Perfect Jesus smile, perfect oh skin. God. Yeah. God. Damn. That's a fucking look he's giving me right now. Ooh. All right, relax. Relax. We got Calvin Cater. I say Calvin Qatar, and people hate that I say Calvin Qatar. I have been saying this guy's name for like 15 years. I'm from Connecticut. He's from Massachusetts. I was managing professional fighters forever. A lot of fighters that fought him and were in the same gyms on the same regional scene. I've had many conversations with him. I've met him many, many times in the same circles. I say Qatar. I've been saying Qatar for 100 years. This doesn't make it right. I'm not saying it's right, but people are like, don't you listen when you do the research? I hear them say cater. Yeah, now I'm confused. I hear them say cater, but I've been saying Qatar for 15 years. It just is what it is. Calvin great story. Cater taking on Aljamain Sterling. Calvin Cater, 23 and 7 overall. He is only two and three in his last five, and he is coming off an 18-month layoff after blowing out his knee in a very unfortunate situation. He's taking on Aljamain Sterling, 23 and four overall, former world champion, taking on, not taking on, four and one in his last five. He is making his featherweight debut. He lost his belt. He got knocked out cold, and then he said, let me gain 10 pounds. That will fix all of my problems. And this is an interesting fight. People do not like my breakdown on this fight. But we got Calvin Cater. This guy's a very good, clean boxer. Probably one of the more technical boxers in this division. He's fast. He's accurate. His hands are always where they are supposed to be. And he's always firing back, bang to the face. Back, bang to the face. Fast, accurate, has some power in there as well. And as everybody else is in that New England cartel fight gym, he is insanely tough. His takedown defense is listed at an incredible 91%. But you dig a little deeper and you realize it has only been tested a handful of times. There's not a ton of actual hardcore wrestlers that were trying to take him down that built up that record. He's taking on Al Jermaine Sterling. This guy is a backpack grappler, meaning he literally wants to get you to the ground and hang out on your back. He's going to latch onto you like skin, like Damon Jackson, like the leech, and he's just going to hang out back there and try to make something happen. Over time, he has developed his own striking style. He throws out a lot of kicks, lands a good amount of significant strikes per minute with five. He only absorbs about two, and that's because he does do a good job with the range control, with the footwork, with the kicks. He is coming off that title loss. He was knocked out by Sean O'Malley, and that did force him to move up and wait. And listen, we have talked about this in the past. Jacob has a tweet where he listed out just the horrendous, horrendous wrestling takedown numbers from Aljamain Sterling. His takedown accuracy is only 24%. He is 12. He got 12 takedowns. And then he missed 63 in his last five fights. In his last five fights, he has missed 63 takedowns. He has failed to take down his opponent 63 times times in his last five fights but as insane as that sounds right as horrendous as that statistic is Aljamain Sterling might be the best wrestler or at least the most determined wrestler that Calvin Qatar Cater has ever fought if you go through his fight history sure he fought the heavy-handed Smeagol in Josh Emmett he doesn't use his wrestling and he fought Zabit Zabit is a very good wrestler. He didn't use it either. Al Jermaine, I think, is the only person that's going to come forward and shoot a million takedowns over. If 
Calvin was fully healthy. He didn't come off an 18-month layoff. He didn't just shatter his knee. He didn't have all those issues. If that was the case, I would be all over Calvin Cater here. Wouldn't I wouldn't even think about it. I'd say he could defend these trash takedowns. He's going to be a million times a better striker. Not even close. He's also going to be bigger. It's not even close. But the 18-month layoff concerns me just a little bit. I think he's going to be a step behind. And as we know, layoffs affect strikers far more than grapplers. It's going to take him a little while to get that timing back, to trust his leg. So I am going to ever absurdly low, ever so slightly lean Al Jermaine Sterling here. But I do genuinely think that this could be a trap. I don't think Al going to look good at all. I think he's going to win some bullshit decision because the judges all of a sudden do like cage control. Because as we've seen in the last couple of months, these judges hate cage control but I think they will like it a little bit here I think Calvin's going to be a step behind for the first round or two and then it's going to be hard to catch back up all because of that layoff Jakey boy what do you think yeah I've had my uh definitely my ups and downs with Aljo I know Aljo probably better than anybody in in this world because he's been my lock of the week a, a couple times he's been my anti lock of the week I picked him against Piotr Jan in both of those fights I picked against him with Sean O'Malley I've had my ups and downs with Aljo I, I know him very well what I know about Aljo is the reason I picked against him against Sean O'Malley is because Sean O'Malley is I mean his footwork is just absolutely insane I knew that Aljo was not gonna be able to track down a guy like Sean O'Malley Sean O'Malley and on his entries I knew he was gonna get hit because he was gonna get a little bit desperate Calvin Guitar is not and I'm gonna call him Guitar because I don't give a fuck Calvin Guitar is a guy that isn't quite as quick, right? These 145ers aren't quite as quick with the footwork. So I think Aljo has the opportunities to get to a leg. And if he gets to a leg, he can be pretty successful. He just has issues sometimes really getting to those single leg type positions. What I'll say about Aljo and that you're going to probably laugh at and people are going to make fun of me, What? but I don't really give a fuck, is Aljo is a very underrated striker. And people have given him this reputation that he cannot strike uh, because he fought probably one of the best boxers in the UFC, regardless of weight class, and Piotr Jan. Definitely one of the best striker, overall strikers, and Sean O'Malley. But people forget against Pedro Munoz, who's a very good a very good striker, very good boxer. He couldn't get a takedown. Uh, outstruck him by 50 significant strikes, won that fight. Against Jimmy Rivera, couldn't get a takedown. Outstruck this guy by 80 significant strikes. Aljo has that funk master style, and it's very effective. It's very effective in decision-type fights because he is constantly scoring. He is constantly the guy moving forward. In that Piotr Jan fight where he got the fourth round DQ and everyone thought he looked shit in that fight, couldn't get a takedown, outstruck Piotr Jan, right? The optics weren't, weren't, weren't great in that fight because he was so desperate with the takedowns, but he still outstruck Piotr Jan. In that second fight, only was down by one in the striking to Piotr Jan. This guy has good striking. He can win fights with striking. I believe he can come in this fight, not get a takedown, not even try to shoot a takedown, and beat a guy like Cam Guitar with his pressure striking, just scoring more points. I still think he's going to get the takedowns. I think there's an opportunity here for Aljo to close the distance with that pressure striking. Cal Calvin isn't a, a footwork, you know, get out of there like a Sean O'Malley. He's a little bit more stationary, get him against the fence. And like Brendan Allen, Sean, or, I mean, uh, Aljamain Sterling isn't a guy that necessarily needs a takedown. Right? He'll just kind of get in that little that little one hook position, throw the yellow hook over, all of a sudden he's got your back and you're in big trouble if he's if he has it. So uh I can't trust a guy like Calvin Guitar, who you know is gonna be I think 37 years old this year, coming off a year and a half layoff and a, a knee injury, and I haven't really seen like too crazy from him lately, especially with like the power, right? I don't think he's gonna be able to put out a guy like Aljo. Aljo moves around, it's the pressure's gonna be too much, and I, I like Aljo here. No, I the layoff is my you're also saying cater now too. I literally Qatar. Said I'm You're saying pay. Qatar, yeah. No, I say Cater. Every time I said I was going to say Cater, and I don't give a fuck. Well, now I'm forgetting the right way to Qatar say it. <laughs> is, the, is the what you're supposed to the say. The country. Um, yeah, I. Uh, the only reason I'm on the Aljo side is the layoff. Without the layoff, if we had seen Calvin recently, it'd be a very different situation. But we didn't, and we haven't. And so you, know you I and I are I aligned here. On the, uh, I saw on the embedded is the last, I don't know how long he's been working with them, but Aljo has been working with Dean. He's been in Vegas and stuff. He's been working with Dean Thomas and Dean Thomas is a fucking smart ass dude. Yeah. He's got you fight IQ him, through yeah, the you roof. You hear him break down fights. He knows what to look for. He knows what is going to work in fights. I think that's a great asset for Aljo to have for his camp. I agree. And I'm not trying to disparage the, uh, you know, the, uh, Ray the Longo Lando. fight camp has, they've put out some world champions and some high level things. They don't, 
always have the best game plans. I think they've got a good pack of guys that have been iron sharpens iron and or iron forges iron, whatever the fuck it is. And I think they have been successful. Is a diamond. They have they have been successful together. They haven't really built anybody from nothing recently, and I don't think they're evolving as a gym. Like we see Marab be Marab. We don't see Marab all of a sudden better anything. We haven't seen Aljo get better at anything. And this is a comment that I saw that I did like is Aljo went from barely winning split decisions every time out to getting flatlined. And I, I get that point. That point is basically that point is basically Aljo wasn't this dominant. He is quite literally the most decorated bantamweight champion of all time. But he barely there's like there's an asterisk how he won the belt with the eye poke or the sorry, the knee to the head. Then there was a bad split decision. Then he fought a dude with one arm. Like it, they're really it, he's barely winning those fights, barely keeping his belt. Then he finally fought somebody very good and got knocked out cold. I agree with every I, I mean, you're not wrong. And if it that's why if it wasn't for the freaking knee injury, we'd have a whole different situation here. Alger rolls him. It's better for the division if he does. So let's hope that's what happens. You're going to spend the $8,400 in DraftKings. That's a great price point if he rolls them. I think there's an opportunity for... Honestly, one of my biggest predictions here is... is, is um, I don't think... I kind of, in my breakdown, said it could have been a close fight, but I think Algie either fucking smokes him or looks clueless. You know? I, I think one of these guys smokes the other. Aljo comes uh, in and it's just too much. You know, like you said, Calvin could come in, looks sharp with the striking, and Al Aljo can't get the takedown. He's looking desperate. Or Aljo comes in, 145, looking big, looking strong, handles the striking, gets a takedown, gets the control, and smokes him. So I think somebody smokes somebody. And I like Aljo. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm looking forward to this fight. This should be the featured prelim. We'll talk about the featured prelim in a second. This actually should be the featured prelim in my mind. This this fight has actual meaningful next steps depending on how it goes and if you do want to unlock everything that you need heading in the fight week go to wewantpicks.com click become a member at the top it is only ten dollars for an entire month that'll give you access to every single thing that we do and we have wewantpicks.com click become a member at the top shoujo said angelo nope shoujo said angelo made sure not to mention henry sudo so you're talking about how aljamain sterling got a gift decision against a guy who hadn't fought in three years is that the reference you're Outstruck talking about too. what a fucking joke Outstruck him too. what a joke a gift decision that most people think won a guy hadn't fought in three years what an absolute joke didn't mention that yeah no shit i also that picked aljo fun. you buffoon you can't, can't copy and paste certain next up at ufc 300 we have it yuri prohashka sorry my microphone just freaked out let me do that over next up at ufc 300 we have yuri prohashka taking on alexander ratchik and people hate the way i pronounce that too it is what it is Yuri Prohashka, 29 and 4 overall. 4 and 1 in his last five. He's coming off that knockout loss to Alex Pajeda. That was to get his belt back. Former light heavyweight champion of the world. Didn't lose his belt inside the octagon. He lost his belt outside of it with a nasty shoulder injury. He's taking on Alexander Rachik. 14 and 3 overall. 3 and 2 in his last five. Coming off the injury TKO to Jan Blahovic two years ago. He was injured. He just like Calvin Qatar blew out his knee in a fight. He's been gone for two full years while that is getting worked on. And this is a bit of a clash of styles type fights. They are both primarily strikers, but they go about it very differently. Yuri, as we know, is a crazy person. Anybody with that haircut and those eyes is either a hippie pushing their dog or cat in a stroller or a psychopath. In this case, Yuri is a psychopath Viking. He comes forward, he stays in your face, he doesn't care if he's hit, and he will just swing. He's been rocked in every fight. He finally got finished, but typically he'll get rocked and he'll keep coming forward. He famously beat Glover Teixeira to win the belt, but what was incredible at that fight is he got his ass kicked. In a 25-minute fight, he got his ass kicked for what? It was like 24 and a half minutes. It was something obscene. There was not much time left. Glover made one mistake. Yuri capitalized and took that belt from him. And if that says anything, it's how durable he is, how mentally strong he is, how he doesn't quit on himself. But Yuri Prohashka will come forward, will stay in your face. He's got good power. He typically has a really good chin. He lands more than five significant strikes per minute, which is an insanely high number. 
but he is hit with just as many coming back the other direction. He did just get knocked out for the first time in the UFC to, I don't want to say lose his belt because it wasn't his belt, but to not win his belt back. Taking on Alexander Rachek. He is a striker as well. He's a dynamic striker. He uses his length and reach really well to out technique and out decision people. He does have a little bit of power, but he's typically looking to stay on the outside, pick you apart, be the better striker. He mixes in kicks really well. He has no issues transitioning from leg kicks to head kicks all while moving forward. And he does have some power, but again, he likes to fight on the outside. He doesn't want to really take any risks. Two year layoff because he blew out. I think it was his knee fighting Jan Blahovich. This is a clash of styles. Alexander does not do well backing up. Alexander is coming off a two-year layoff. I think Yuri, as sloppy as he is, as hittable as he is, he was just knocked out cold, which isn't, well, not cold. It was actually an early stoppage, but he was just finished, which is not a great look. But I do think he comes forward, stays in Alexander's face, gives him a really hard time. Alexander's not going to find his rhythm two years out of that cage. He already doesn't like fighting in the pocket. I think Yuri is actually going to do what he does. Absorb some punishment, make it ugly, stay in somebody's face and get the win. I think Yuri wins this fight. And uh, he's not a humongous underdog here, but I do like him as a dog. What do you think, Jakey boy? Yeah, Yuri sucks. And I, I uh, agree. Uh, wait, hold on. Sorry. I agree with that statement. Go ahead. Yeah, so Yuri sucks. And, and I try to wait, warn wait, wait. everybody about that um, with the Alex Pajeda fight. Um, but I will say that there's decent value on Yuri. There was. And I got that for our premium members. It's, I, I, I'm i sitting here right now and say, I, I think he, that Yuri sucks. And, but I put money on Yuri. And the premium members saw that line early. Um, it's inside the distance decisional action. I got that minus 115. It's minus 175 now. Because I think he's going to be the more live fighter, right? And he, Yuri has the opportunity to finish anybody he's going to fight with that unorthodox style. The, able, the ability to normally take a shot to give a shot, which, as you mentioned, is not a good recipe for a guy like Rocket. But Rakic is a, you know, he's a, he's a very technical guy. And what I like about him, there's two things I really like about him in this matchup. Number one, I, I, I can see him dropping this first round because I think that the unorthodox style coming back after two years is going to be a little awkward for Rocky in, in, in the beginning of this fight. But once he figures it out, I think he's going to be fine. But the one thing I love is even in that first round, even if he drops that first round, he's going to be scoring. And he's going to be scoring with the same way that Alex was scoring. Alex lost the first round versus Yuri, but he he put in the, the, the literal legwork with those calf kicks. Yuri's leg was fucked up. And that's why he had to go to wrestling. And that's why he had to get so aggressive in the second round because he couldn't stay at distance because of those calf kicks. Rocky has almost that carbon copy calf kick of Alex Pajeda. Obviously, nobody's going to throw it exactly the same, but he snaps that fucking leg kick almost exactly the same. And I believe that even in the first round of him trying to find that timing, that that calf is going to get beaten up. He's going to throw that calf kick. He's going to throw that calf kick. And then when the calf is getting beaten up and Yuri is coming with the pressure, instead of backing up like Alex Pajeda and trying to find that shot, this is where he's going to level change. The year he pressure is going to come, he's going to level change. Rockets wrestling and grappling is very underrated. He doesn't really use it a lot, but when he uses it, you can see how good he is. And I know a lot of people are going to be like, and I said in Discord, well, Glover had the top control, but Glover was able to get swept and he was getting reversed. Glover was getting a little bit probably too aggressive in the submissions, right? He he is a submission Pull a guy. Pull for Christ's right, sake. Right, I mean, yeah. but even in, when he was in top positions, he's doing, he's being yeah. aggressive to try to work submissions. Rocky, in my mind, if he gets a takedown, he'll lay it half guard and he'll control the fight and eat you up with elbows and he's got a lot more control and he's a big fucking dude as well. So, I like Rocky here because I think he's going to be able to find the timing in the first round, start to take over in the second and third. I fully expect it probably to be a decision. I respect the, t the, the toughness of Yuri, but I think he takes the last Last two rounds and honestly if Rocky comes in and wins the first round I think Yuri's in big trouble because he's going to already find the timing stay out of danger level change get some takedowns so I like Rocky here and uh, I, I kind of like it, the value obviously there's always going to be the question marks we just talked about it with um, with uh, what's his name uh, as far as coming off a of knee surgery and stuff but he seemed like he did it right and he's still a young guy 32 years old so uh, I think he's going to be fine yeah I mean I think uh, I don't It'll be interesting. It's another... I'm going against all these long layoff guys. Every single one of them. Especially strikers. Strikers do not do well with long layoffs. So, did you time out a guy that said gray is not Angelo's color? I did time him out, and I was laughing <laughs> at it. I just thought it was funny. I hope he was just timed out, because on my side, it says banned. I didn't ban him. I just tried to time him out for 30 seconds. I just thought it was funny. Gray is not your color. I timed out some other guy that was like... He just said something about... Uh, 
Oh, J- even Jiri said it wasn't an early stoppage, idiot, LOL. And I just timed him out and I laughed at yeah, it. Yeah, he was definitely out. Yeah, G- I get it. Point being, that was a title fight. You let it go a little bit longer. But either way, my my didn't change the overall point. My concern here, so I picked Jiri to win. I think Jiri closes Yuri. the distance. What? Who gives a fuck, honestly? I think he closes the distance, stays in a racket. Ch- it does end in a ch, by the way. Stays in his face and makes it ugly. But he was just knocked out. He was just knocked out. I don't know if that's going to change how he fights. Do you think that changes how he fights? Like, some people get knocked out and I, they they aren't so willing to enter the pocket and be into a firefight anymore. Yeah, I don't, I don't think he's going to give a fuck. I don't think he's going to give a fuck either, which is why why I'm on that side. But that is, a, that is the only real concern I have. Because outside of that, I don't think we got a problem here. Yeah, and so you said, officially uh, picked Ratchik? Yeah, Rat- I got money Rat- on him kick. as well. You want to fucking bet this, pussy? I'll save all the money for the other fight that we disagree on. I only have three hundred fifty dollars left in my bedroom. Yeah, plate. well, I've got almost a thousand, I think, and it's all yours, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so you said, spend- uh, Yuri plus three and a half. They don't. The, the line's too close. They don't have that bet offered. At least I bet online. Oh, because it would be minus a gazillion because it's a two and a half round line as well. So, um, okay. Are you going to have either one of these uh, gentlemen in your DraftKings lineup? I don't think Alex is going to score a, a ton. I think he's going to be pretty tentative early. He makes it a takedown or two. And I think if he gets a takedown, he's just going to have control and not a whole lot with it. So um, I could see like 50 strikes and a couple takedowns and a decision win. What's going to score? 60 or 70? Probably not worth it. Yeah, I, and it's an interesting matchup because I know technically it's striker versus striker and Yuri's a wild man, but Ratchik is not a wild man at all. He's composed. He fights on the outside. So this could, to your point, be boring. But we'll see how it goes, and you should see what we have to offer you at Premium Membership. We want picks.com. Click Become a Member at the top. It's only $10 a month, and it's just a fantastic way to support all of us. Fight Talk Only says, Angelo, can I please get invited to a Fight Foods? I will clean up after myself. I have a clean record, and I'll stay at Jacob's house. Well, Jacob has no room. That's a pretty small place. Uh, what he's talking about, anybody new here doesn't know what this is, I film a vlog for every single UFC pay-per-view. I have my friends come over, Jacob included. I cook some good food. We film it. We hang out. We do all the things. I will have a vlog for UFC 300. It's going to be a little different, though. No Jakey boy. And no Jakey boy because I have to go to the daddy-daughter dance. I got to take my two beautiful little girls to the dance, do all the things, and that is right smack during the prelims. Uh, tell me about it. Pussy. Right smack during the prelims. So that kind of screws some things up. And understandably so, Jacob's like... All because you couldn't wear a couple condoms. <laughs> I do do love those little rat girls. Guys, if you want a couple of bucks, we'll give you a couple of bucks. Go to this URL, use the link, sign up, make a deposit. We send you 50 as a thank you. It's affiliate marketing. As long as you use the link and make a deposit... We send you 50 and Angelo's stuff as a thing. It's like Augustus Gloop. Who's Augustus Gloop? Uh, what an uncultured piece of shit swine you are. You fuck face bitch. Shit is that brain. The, is, that the, is that the kid from Matilda? What's was that kid's name? Just every day you find some new way to fucking embarrass yourself. And honestly, okay. I don't know how long I can do this. Anyway, guys. You can unlock the safety parlay. The safety parlay is the beacon of stability in this space. And while this has been a rocky road this year, it continues to do exceedingly well. Almost a 70% event win rate. 9-0 and in the last six pay-per-views. Multiple pay-per-views. I give you more than one safety parlay. Torque actually asked, Angelo, are there multiple safety parlays or were the other ones just on your page as regular bets? When I do two safety parlays, they are both in the safety parlay category. You will see them both there. It'll be the base and then the third leg, and that's listed out as a separate parlay. I never will call a random parlay a safety parlay. It has its own entire section on my premium page on We Want Picks. You'll also see every safety parlay that's ever existed, every lock of the week that's ever existed. Ooh, the full history. Lock of the week's up almost four units this year, up almost 30 units in totality. So if you want something that's going to fucking get your dick hard, and ram it into something. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It's only $10 an entire month. And before we move on, I did. Oh, it stretched the hell out of this image. I bought a $1,000 UFC 300 limited edition mystery box. Can we tell and a I story will... about this too? 
Yeah, go ahead. You can do it. Are you going to interrupt and act like it's not no, true? No, no, no. Well, you're, I mean, you I'm were, sure you'll. F- you were sitting there. I mean, you called me and you were talking about this box. I was like, "Oh, it sounds it sounds pretty cool." You're like, "Yeah, you know, you, you, I think your direct quote was, you know, if it was five hundred, I think, but I don't, you know, thousand, I think I'm, I'm going to do it." And I said, "Fuck it." I said, "Well, I'm going to buy it then because I'll open it on stream. It'll be a fucking awesome." You said, "I'm going to, I'm going to get it. I'm going to, I'm actually going to buy it. I'm going to buy it." <laughs> so I, I was like, "What the fuck?" So I didn't even buy one. I think it'd be more fun if I opened it. But I agree. And, I think you should open mine. I I agree. It will be more fun with you opening. I hundred percent agree. Angela's like, how do I do it? It's like, you just fucking open it and be like, holy shit, look at this. It's fucking panties from Misha Tate from <laughs> UFC 200. So what this is, is it's a thousand dollar mystery, but I actually bought it thinking it was this box. And I hope it does come like a box like I this. I think it is. Well, I watched other unboxings yeah, know, of previous thing. ones. Yeah. So anyway, it's a mystery box and they're teasing that it could have fight worn gloves in it. Like. It is literally stuff from UFC 300 that they shove in this box and they mail out the next day. So I no. should have this. What do you I mean? I thought no. you're already supposed to get. Oh, no, because it, it could include tickets to 301, right? Or Correct. 303. No, 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 no. Not 301. Okay. That's in Brazil. So in the box right, you're are right. items from the actual UFC 300. It could be gloves. It could be a shirt. It could be anything from the event. Sign anything. You don't know. That's why it's a mystery box. And they've only made 300 of these boxes. One of them will have tickets to the International Fight Week card, 302 or 303, right, right, whatever right. that is. So I might even get tickets to the Fight Week card. I don't know. Probably not. I've never take? won anything like that. I'd, I'd probably have to take Tiffany. Probably have to. I know. Tell me about it. Um, but I did check today. They're still for sale, which means they have not sold all 300. So anyway, this is here to tell you that I did that and to tell you to <laughs> please like Please subscribe. Please click the bell because there's far more content on this channel between the vlogs, the picks, the lock of the week, the minty video. There's far more on this channel than just this Tuesday live stream. So click the buttons, subscribe. We appreciate you. Next up, it's your boy, Jacob. Get it together so we can hear this hot take. Next up at UFC 300, we have Bo Nickel taking on Cody Brundage in the main card opener of the greatest pay-per-view of all time. I think, here's my theory, a lot of people hate the fact that Bo Nickel is on the main card. I personally think they put him on the that main card. scarecrow, for, bitch. I think they put him on the, he lives up the street, dude. Mind your mouth. Get out I, of here, crows. I think, dude, you guys look the same. I don't have no floppy fucking ears. Those are battle tested because he did something with his life outside of sitting in that fucking chair. You have a dent in your head from your stupid live streams. Get your life together. You're making fun of the... Uh, and I, I think they put Bo Nickel on the main card for two reasons. One, I think they literally know that this fight will not go very long in either direction. And they have three other fights scheduled for 25 minutes. And also, they obviously want to turn Bo Nickel into a superstar. Those two things. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck with this one, right. UFC. You done fucked it up, buddy. <laughs> You'll have your chance. We have Bo Nickel, 5-0. and The entirety of his MMA career has only been five fights, all five of them by early stoppage. Taking on Cody Brundage. Cody Brundage, 10-5 and overall. He is 2-3 and in his last five. He is coming off of the Rampage Jackson-style triangle slam over uh, whatever the hell that guy's name was that screwed safety my safety parlay, parlay that week. Zach Reese. But this is an interesting breakdown because Bo Nickel, if you do not know, is a very, very accomplished wrestler. He was a Penn State wrestler, multiple Division I national championships, one of the better wrestlers in the last 20 years or so. He did not do anything in the Olympics. I don't think he qualified for the Olympic team, but he tried. He is a very good wrestler. He has a very aggressive style that works well for MMA. He's taken on Cody. Oh, sorry. And he's developing his hands. He did just knock out Val Woodburn with one punch. He's taken on Cody Brundage. Cody Brundage gets a lot of flack. A lot of people instantly say Cody sucks. I disagree with that statement. And every breakdown I have ever made for Cody Brundage, including when I picked Zach Reese to beat him handily, and I was clearly wrong, I always say how talented Cody Brundage is. He's a very good wrestler. He's got very heavy hands. He's got good striking. Cody Brundage's quote-unquote issue is, I don't know if he gets 
too excited, overzealous, but he will occasionally make poor decisions in fights. He was very clearly could have beaten the piss out of SD Dumas. Took that guy down half a second. Nope, not a concern in the world, no problem. Then started jumping guillotine. And I don't know if it was a short notice fight, it was cardio, I don't know what. But in almost every single Cody Brundage fight, this guy has won the first 30 seconds to a minute. He beat the piss out of uh, Vieira there. What the hell's his first name? Rodolfo. Rodolfo. He beat the shit out of Rodolfo Vieira and then slowed down a little bit and the tides turned. My point being, Cody Brundage could be that guy skill set wise. I bet Cody Brundage is one of the best guys they're trained with in the gym because he is good everywhere. He's strong, he's fast, he hits hard, he can wrestle, he is good everywhere. But sometimes in the cage, he will make decisions that don't necessarily go his way. I do think Bo Nickel wins this fight. I also think that these odds are correct. And that's not a slight on Cody Brundage. If you take the minus 2,300 odds and you convert them to probability, it's like 95%. I, with 95% confidence, think Bo Nickel wins. And that is entirely because of his wrestling credentials. He obviously will have to avoid the chaos that could be Cody Brundage on his feet in the first however long. But if he gets it to the cage, same way he did with... Jamie Pickett, same way he did with others. If he gets it to the cage and gets it to the ground, I think that's it. Bo Nickel not only is a very good wrestler, he's also a very good grappler that did not get submitted by Gordon Ryan. They they grappled to a draw, Jacob. Um, let's hear your pick. Can't wait for this. Can't wait for it. Thank God. I mean, I, I had something exciting. ready to go, and then that last comment is just like, we already talked about that today. Like, Gordon Ryan couldn't submit Bo Nickel. It's like, ooh. I watched it with my own two eyes. I watched it with my own two eyes. I mean, let me be open and honest with everyone. I'm a, I'm a big Cody Brunage fan. I think Bo Nickel is a little bit fraudulent. And I'll, I, I'll be straight, but I, I, I thought – that going into this week that I was going to make this in incredible video, come on here, and it had this incredible story about the, all these underdog wins, right? David and Goliath, right? Buster Douglas. I mean, all these. And I thought I was going to stack it up and have this great speech, this motivational speech for Cody Brundage, ready to go. Like, you can do this. I know all the odds are stacked against you, but you got this, man. And try to really motivate this motherfucker. And then I thought to myself, you know what? Who the fuck is Bo Nickel? Huh? Who the fuck is Bo Nickel? This dude 5-0 and in mixed martial arts? Who the fuck is Bo Nickel? I don't give a fuck what he's done at Penn State. It's a mixed martial arts fight, right? And Cody Brunage is going to be he's gonna be the better striker, much better striker in this fight. So I'm looking at this fight thinking, big underdog, adversity, adversity story, fuck that. Cody Brunage is the better fucking fighter. So I don't need to motivate a guy like Cody Brunage who's going to be the better striker. Oh, Bo, you want to prove you're the better striker? Right, you you talking all this shit about all your strike and oh your mommy taught you how to strike all this stuff. You knocked out Val, right? Do it, do it again, Bo. Do it again. Do it again, Bo. Let's knock this guy out. Let's knock out Cody Brundage. Do it. Fucking try it. I bet you won't. I bet you will turn into this fucking wrestling guy. You're going to one, two around. You're going to throw one exchange. You're going to feel one shot from Cody Brundage. And I guarantee you take that fucking shot, you pussy. You will not stand with this guy, Cody Brundage. Because everyone knows what will happen. <laughs> everyone knows that you're going to turn out to be a fucking fraud if you stand with this guy, Cody Brundage. So fucking try it, Bo. I'd love to see it. I think you might. And when you do, you're going to pay a heavy fucking price. Cody Brundage, round one. There's only two people picking Cody Brundage. Three people. There's logical people that are like, yeah, he could be live early. But they're not picking him, right? They're saying he could be live early. And then there's people who want to pick the biggest underdog in UFC history. Bo Nickel is quite literally the biggest favorite in the history of the sport right now, or at least in the history of UFC. Nobody's ever been this big of a favorite. So you pick against them so that if you're right, you can pretend that you're a genius, right? And if you're wrong, eh, who cares? The guy was plus, of course. So there's that. And then there's people who DM with some of the fighters, and they're afraid to say what they actually think because they DM with some of the fighters. I, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure I know what category. Baby Red over here. Actually, can you put your face next to Bo Nichols and tell me you two don't look the fuck alike? I mean, it's insane. You have the exact same freckle situation. Exact I mean, same it striking is, abilities. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> exact same striking abilities. Uh, that's a fair point. Yeah, you may. 
You may. I, I'm not picking Bo Nickel because he's a better striker. I, literally, because of the wrestling. I will say, this is phenomenal matchmaking by the UFC. You because really think, but do you really think that he is going to come in, UFC 300, open the card, and just shoot a takedown and try to be... But I, I don't see it, dude. This guy came in against Val. I know it's Val. It's a little he bit different. He threw one punch. But, I mean, it he was, was a 30-second I mean, fight. I know, but he was. you could tell he was jazzed up to show off the fucking striking. I truly believe that Bo Nickel is not going to come in and shoot a takedown. He's going to try and strike with this guy, and his striking is telegraphed. It's lungy, and Brunton is a good striker. It is very lungy. No, Brunton no, no, is I, a good striker. He's a good I, striker. Powerful, fat. I agree with every single thing you're saying. I do think Bo will wrestle. Bo actually respects Cody. Bo is like he's good, dude. I get, dude. He says so. That I because, because he, no, he, says, he that, says that, but because he's supposed to say that, I guarantee. Because Bo Nickel, nobody loves Bo Nickel more than Bo Nickel, and he's already talked about. I'm going to be the champion of this, and I'm going to beat Shim I have and stuff like that. So maybe in the in the public, he's being like, yeah, I respect Cody, and I know what he brings. I guarantee when it's like me and you talking, him and his boys. He thinks Cody Brunage is a fucking joke. He thinks these odds are funny. He's talking to his friends. I'm going to do this to him, and I bet I can knock him out with this, and I bet I can finish it in 10 seconds. I guarantee he's having those conversations privately, and he's going to come in and be in for a rude fucking awakening. So all of that is possible, but he also just said uh, the greatest, one of, not the, but one of the greatest American wrestlers of all time was a fraud. He's not afraid to say what he thinks. So I, I disagree with that statement. I think he does. This is a natural evolution. <laughs> somebody, said, somebody just randomly said, what if he doesn't have friends? <laughs> <laughs> this is a natural evolution in his career. Cody Brundage is by far the best opponent that Bo Nickel has fought. It's a natural evolution. And then if he beats him, he'll fight him. So the matchmaking makes sense. The odds, I actually, they're crazy. They make sense just given the credentials and the clear path to win. With that being said, do and not Cody bet knows on how to wrestle. By the way, this is correct. This isn't fucking correct. Jamie Pickett. This isn't we all. This There's different levels, to, but yeah, correct. Yeah, 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 right. There are different levels. I mean, this is a straight wrestling match. Bo Nickel probably wins, but this is mixed martial arts. Other things are involved, and uh, Cody also has a, a nasty guillotine. <laughs> he has a nasty Cody. Please don't, please don't do the guillotine, but he does have kind of a nasty guillotine. But listen, I would love so in the. I have zero money on Bo Nickel, and you shouldn't either. These odds are too ridiculous. Go get out a calculator, build yourself a parlay, then add Bo Nickel and watch it add 35 cents to the payout. Do not add that level of risk. There is still risk. This is still a fist fight. But Bo Nickel could break his shin. He could get knocked out. Like anything could happen. It's absurd to put Bo Nickel in a parlay with any odds that look anything like this. It's absurd. Well, you, we I could mean, all be positive he wins, but don't bet on it. It's crazy. I think that this is how the fight's going to go. Right, and I'm gonna eventually clip this up to the the actual fight because I know this is how it's gonna go. It's gonna look amazing when I'm saying something. Then it's gonna happen. Bo's gonna come in, try to strike immediately, get hit. People are gonna gasp a little bit. He's not gonna get like like stagger, but people are it's gonna be like pop pop, and people be like uh oh, and then Bo's gonna shoot right, and he's not gonna get that first takedown, and then people are gonna be like. Uh oh, because he already got hit and then he got stuffed on the takedown. And then he's going to look a little bit desperate in there. And Cody's going to hit him with really something fucking big. And he's going to get really hurt. And, and Cody's going to finish him on the ground. A little TKO. So, um, what the hell? I forget what I was going to say, too. But it'll be, uh, oh, in the moment, watching the fights in that moment in my media room, I will want Cody to win. I think it would be, as a fan, in that moment, would be unbelievable. That place would go crazy. The biggest favorite of all time when in the moment. But for the division, it's better if Bo... We need a superstar. And if Bo... I, I, this, is a, this is what I feel. I feel that Bo Nickel can be what Hamzat thinks he is. Hamzat has no fucking cardio. Oh I think God, Bo Nickel dude. can be what Hamzat thinks he is. You disagree with that? Dude, Hamzat is like probably... Five times the ten times the striker that Bo is at this point. Correct, and he's also much farther along in his career. I'm saying can be, can be, what Hamza thinks he is. Hamza also has four minutes of cardio. Well, how much does Bo have? We have no idea. You just assume Hamza is a wrestler too, with all these wrestling. Stuff we've and seen you see him work hard and all this stuff, and you've never. We've seen, seen Hamza gas. We haven't had the opportunity to see Bo so gas. He's just no too good, too fast. Bo, the funniest thing in the world would be Bo is is getting some wrestling. Off I don't think he beats Cody. Hamzat right now. I'm not saying he beats him right now. I'm not fucking talking about that right now. I'm saying the well, funniest the thing that would happen section. in this fight would be um, that Bo has some success but doesn't get to finish in the first round. 
And then it's Bo Nickel that's fucking all of a sudden a like gas. He's like the he tired one, and yeah, Cody's just I mean, fresh, crazy. making good decisions. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm looking. I'm like Bo Nickel goes out like Dennis. Uh, was it Dennis? Dennis? Uh, what's his name in the bazook? Budka. Oh, Budka yeah, just whatever. The crotch just all sniffing sudden, it's just like, loser. All sudden, it's just like, oh, this guy's dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, listen. I think. Uh, I think, in the moment, I would love to watch Cody Brunish win this fight. I would love it. Well, I got good news for you. But it's better. <laughs> I got, I got. Great I news. think, but I think come fight night, Bo Nickel will be worth that price tag. Not the betting odds. Don't touch that. That's ridiculous. Ninety five hundred dollars in DraftKings. He has covered that in every single fight he has ever been in. I think he does more of the same. We talked about the UFC knowing what they're doing with matchups. That's what we got here. You raise your hand. What do you need? So, I don't this guy since Jacob has only gotten ten percent of his picks right since he made his channel. I don't even know what the fuck that means or how it, you would have to be really you have to try really hard to only get ten percent of your picks right. I have no idea what that means. But people just like uh, say li- random yeah, shit. Yeah, just li- live stream. Uh, live stream Saturday. I will be streaming UFC three hundred. I will be watching this fight live with you guys. And when Cody Brunage wins, there's a wall right here that I'm gonna fucking run straight through. And I pray to God that there's not a stud right there because I'm gonna be fucking. <laughs> As shit. <laughs> well, get a second camera. I'd love to watch your... Anybody who watches Jersey Shore, they know the situation where he slams his head against the wall. Jeez, and just and ends, up, Italian ends up in a, in a neck brace. That plastered <laughs> fucking... <laughs> shockwave. He goes... Ah. <laughs> he did shockwave. Those, those houses are built a little <laughs> different than, <laughs> yeah. than these drywall fucking construction. Yeah, yeah. The the best is like him with sunglasses on and the neck brace, just like angrily eating chicken cutlets. <laughs> anyway, guys, if you want to unlock our premium service, just go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top. It's ten dollars for an entire month. You'll get picks, bets, tools, anything you could ever want or need for every single fight week in an entire month. Next up at UFC three hundred, we have a hotly debated fight we have charles Oliveira as a two-to-one underdog taking on armin sarukian charles Oliveira, while he is a two-to-one underdog seems to be the overwhelming public favorite i have seen maybe five percent of the comments say armin wins and 95 percent say the champ has a name the champ has a name trash take bad take it is charles du bronx where did that come from where did that come from he said it. He said the champion. He always said the champion has a name. Oh, I didn't even it's know that's where him. it came from. Oh, fucking casual, man. I, I guess so. Oh, what an insult. Anyway, we got Charles Oliveira, the former lightweight world champion, 34 and nine in his career, four and one in his last five, coming off that finish win over Benil Darius, Armin Sarukian, 21 and three in his career, also four and one and five, coming off his finish win over Benil. I have to sneeze. Hey, hey, yeah. put your hand up here real quick. Bless me. Bless you. Thank you so much. Ah, that felt good. I, f- I feel the blessings. Yeah, I and so will Armin, because I think Armin wins this fight. I think Armin, frankly, and you guys hated this when I said it the other day, is basically a little Islam. I know it's the same weight class. He seems smaller. He's a little Islam. He's going to wrestle not nearly as well as Islam, but I think Armin's a better striker than Islam, and people hate that take too. I think Armin's a good striker with phenomenal wrestling, and I think most people can agree with that. Not agreeing with that is insane. We know he's got very good wrestling, and we know he's got pretty good striking. Armin Sarukin is a guy that will come forward, strike, Work in the takedowns. He's not desperate for either one. He's not immediately shooting. He's not winging wild punches. We did watch him get ice skated a little bit against Joaquin Silva, but Joaquin Silva hits like a freight train. But Armin Sarukian, similar to an Islam, will come forward, shoot takedowns, and not be afraid to wrestle. He's taking on Charles Oliveira. Charles Oliveira, as we all know, laser pinpoint accuracy striker. The most submission wins in the history of the UFC. He is dangerous on his feet. He is dangerous on the ground. He gets his own offensive takedown. Charles Oliveira was that guy for a long time. He was a bit of a journeyman, losing odds and ends, videos of him tapping out, quitting, turning his head, getting finished, and then all of a sudden he put it together and then went on a wild, a wild tear. 
beat pretty much every single person they put in front of him and made it look easy, was finishing everybody. That only blemish in the last however long is that one loss, and it was to Islam Makachev, the current champion. Because unlike a Justin Gagey who rocked Charles, he dropped Charles, dropped him, but didn't follow him to the ground. He was afraid to go on the ground with him. So then Charles shook it off as he does, and then he finished Justin Gagey. Pretty sure Dustin Poirier dropped him as well. If it wasn't him, it was... uh, Chandler Michael did. Chandler. Yeah, Chandler dropped him as well. Also didn't go to the ground with him. Islam. I think he said, did. Well, Islam said, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to the ground with this guy. Went to the ground with him, submitted Charles Oliveira. I think this is the same. And people hate that take. Like, the hate that I get for picking a two-to-one favorite is crazy. It's He's a two-to-one favorite. I'm picking the favorite. I think he gets the takedowns. Doesn't get submitted, and I don't know if he could submit Charles because I don't think he's as good on the ground as Islam is, but he can certainly do some work on top. We watched him in the Joel Alvarez fight, and this feels very similar to that. Not skill-wise. Charles is 10 times better than Joel, but I picked Armin to beat Joel. The community came from my head, and then Armin beat the shit out of Joel. I think this is going to be a similar thing. I think Armin is the number two guy on the planet. Jakey boy, what do you think? Yeah, Armin sucks. And one of my there favorite thing, one of my favorite things to do, honestly, and this kind of is, it, it, it's a little bit transferable from the Bo Nickel fight, but a little bit different. I, I talked about Bo Nickel coming off that KO with Val, and and what I love to do more than anything is fade these favorite wrestlers coming off of KOs, because just like Bo coming off that knockout, That's it's fair. probably going to strike with Cody. I guarantee Armin coming off that big knockout versus Darius, another grappler, he is going to come in knowing that Charles can get hurt, knowing that you can drop a guy like Charles, and he is going to try and strike with Charles. And yeah, you might be able to strike with Charles for a little bit, but we saw Armin get put on skates pretty bad just two fights ago. And what was that strike that he got put on skates with? A nice little left hook. And one of Charles' best strikes is that nice tight left hook. And if he lands on the chin instead of the temple that was laying on Armin, he is going to get put out and he is going to get hurt. I also think that that uh, Oliveira can have much more success, even if he is off his back, than against he, uh, Islam. Islam, he went in that fight, was way too aggressive, got in trouble early, was pulling guard, was just like trying to do a, do a lot more wild stuff. I think this one, he, he he turns into the Charles of old that we were used to seeing against like the Darius, against the whatever, to where he's, he's striking, he's aggressive, but he's landing some good shots. I think Armin's going to hang out on the feet too much because it's uh, Charles is one of those guys where... You're gonna land, and you're, you're gonna, gonna think land. You keep landing. That's exactly yeah. right, right? And you might yeah. hurt him, no, whatever. You. And you're gonna, and you're gonna be like, "Yes, here we go. I'm gonna get this knockout." And all of a sudden, you're fucking hurt. And once Charles has you hurt, it is bad news because he is Correct. gonna jump all over you. The bet that I like that I played and it's moving a little bit. His fight does not go the distance. I can't believe it's only minus two fifty. Charles Oliveira, I don't think has been to a decision in his last ten years. Yeah, he gets finished. Yeah, he ten gets years. Finished. He will yeah. go out on a shield. He will be aggressive. Um, and maybe I'll jinx it here. It, it, it's still moving towards the other side, but um, I, I, I like that bet. And um, But I'm, I got to go Charles Oliveira here. I, I think that Armin, I, I've been against Armin. I think I picked him against Darius, but I think I picked against him in every single fight. I do have a little bit of a bias against Armin. I think he's a little bit fraudulent. I think Charles can catch him on the feet, <laughs> hard him enough to engage in the grappling. And obviously we know what Charles can do in the grappling. So um, the, other, the last thing I want to say is I think Armin, if he gets in trouble with the grappling, Michael Chandler was able to survive because he was like, all right, I'm just going to fucking survive. Armin, I think, is going to scramble to try and get back to his feet. I don't want to be on the ground with this guy. And when you scramble, when you're trying to get out of positions, that's when you get caught. So I'm going Charles Dubronx, Oliveira, the champion has a name. Listen, I I get the love for Charles Oliveira. I, I do think he's a bit overrated. And I don't like he's he beat everybody he was supposed he's to a beat. Three time so, champion. Yeah, no, exactly. He beat everybody he's supposed to beat. It's not his fault. But he was fortunate enough to beat the old guard. He got Dustin Poirier. He got uh, uh, Justin Gagey. He got uh, Justin just uh, Michael BSD. Chandler. Justin That's the Gagey's old guard. fighting for the BMF. He's a BMF champion. The new guard is Michael Armin. Chandler's about to fight Conor McGregor. The new guard is Armin Islam. Those guys, those Dagestanis, the Russians, those guys are the new guard. The beast wrestlers that have tech, Garam, like those guys are the new guard. And I think Charles at perfect timing, the people he was able to beat when he was able to beat them. I agree with, no, Garam, Kutaladzidzi. 
Didn't he lost his last three fights or two fights? He lost one. Um, but I do think uh, you have a valid point with the whole Armin just knocked out somebody and he thinks he's going to be able to strike. That That is a very valid point. But And he is young, which worries me a little bit. But typically these guys will stick to the proper game plan. And my whole point, somebody said, what's Armin's win that's so good, that's better than Charles? He doesn't have a win that is better than Charles yet. But nobody does until they do. I think it's literally a clash of styles. I think the wrestling is going to be too much. We have seen Charles out-wrestled many times in the past. I think the wrestling is too much. And I think he avoids getting submitted. So that's why I think Armin wins. I will tell you, all of the people screaming and yelling in the comment sections, no, I was just going to say, I already have, I do have a bet on him for premium. You can check that out. I do have him in a parlay, but not the safety parlay. I left him out of the safety parlay. I wanted to do this. I wanted him in there. And I left him out because I'm like, everybody's just screaming and yelling. This is crazy. So I did leave him out because, I, you know, I said, what am I missing? So we are on opposite sides of this fight. Opposite sides of the scale as well. Yeah, not only that, this guy goes, first time watching the stream, I love the predictions. Guy up top looks really short. The fuck? Stand up and, I mean, you can stand up and show him. I can stand up. I will stand up. Yeah, fuck this guy. You gotta watch him hop out of that chair. <laughs> Whoop. My legs are dangling. Come on, camera, follow me, camera. Well, now it's, you're not gonna be able to tell, really. 6'3". Boom. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> What's going Come on, on down camera, there? Come on, my face. Oh, shit. It's not finding my face. Up we go. Oh, God. Here we go. UFC 300. Sorry, go. guys. Like the stream if you haven't already. We appreciate it. There's almost a thousand people in here, which is pretty fun. What is going on with the camera? Uh, up we yeah, go. Yeah, Angelo really kind of fucked this up. But since we don't have Angelo, <laughs> let me just say that his whole entire you know arm and breakdown I, I pray to god that you guys did not listen to that fucking bullshit because we all know the that Charles Oliveira is gonna absolutely fucking smoke this dude come on man it is dude Bronx baby he's focused he's locked in he's ready to go <laughs> there we it's go it's crazy how much he's gonna dominate this fight and hopefully Angelo <laughs> Can thank be a you for bit more thank you for covering me. <laughs> thank you for covering me, Jacob. You're the one who told me to stand up, all because this guy said I, I didn't was say. Short. I said don't do the camera because it's gonna fucking. You could have just stood up. You didn't have to fucking make the camera go with you. Then all you would have seen in my genitals. It would have been. You would have seen tall dipshit. You fuck idiot. <laughs> just like that eclipse video of the balls that go that go uh, that I slowly mean, go the, over the eclipse. That's that dad humor that we're talking about. Like you sent me that, and it's like you're like. <gasps> oh, that was video? hilarious. Watch that was video. hilarious. Oh, get the hell watch out of here. The video. Like, that was hilarious. Watch the video. Watch it. It's balls. You balls. didn't know what the video was. It, dude, I've seen every every single person has said that. That was in the Discord. <laughs> 50,000 times, Angela. That's what I'm talking about. You think you're unique in it. Dude, watch it, dude. Watch his balls. <laughs> well, I thought it was funny. So, all right. That's all right. What I'm talking about. Well, let's move on, Jacob. And yes, I am tall. You fucking losers. And if you want to see how tall I am, Jacob and I fist fought. You can watch me next to Jacob in that fight. Next up, at UFC 300, we have the featured fight of the evening, the first of three title fights. We have Justin Gagey fighting Max Holloway for the BMF belt. Here's a quick history lesson on the BMF belt. I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, but this belt was invented at UFC 244. The very first time they unveiled this belt was at UFC 244, and it was Jorge Masvidal versus Nate Diaz. And the reason they invented this belt... Wait, why don't you just show it? Get it up there. I do have it. Please yeah, hold. there you go. Sweet tats, bro. Thanks so much. The reason they invented this belt, and anybody wondering what this is, Dr. Y, the one who's been donating all night long, bought us this belt, $1,000 replica belt from the UFC website. Bought us this. Solid. It's This is what, 15, 20 pounds? Like, it's pretty heavy. Bought us this belt, so when Jacob and I fought, the winner got to keep the belt. You can tell who won. Right here on the side, you're going to see 244. This was unveiled at UFC 244. <laughs> On this side, you're going to see 500. That's UFC. That was the 500th UFC event. What are we laughing at? Don't put it down. People want to see you try it on. I don't have that kind of time, Jacob. We're <laughs> two hours into this. If you anyway. don't know, that's a 55-inch belt that Angelo cannot put on. <laughs> so. Okay. Anyway, um, they 
created this vet for that fight because of two things. One, well, really only one reason, and they needed a belt for the main event. The main event of a Madison Square Garden card was not a title fight. So they invented the BMF, the baddest motherfucker belt. And it made sense. It was George Masvidal, the guy that slapped Leon Edwards backstage for talking shit. Nate Diaz, the guy that will slap anybody at any time for any reason. And it made sense. But at the time, they said this belt would never be defended. It's a one and done thing. There's no lineage. It doesn't get defended. And since then, Jorge Masvidal went on the fight five, six times. Never once was the BMF belt on the line. Jorge Masvidal retires. And then they said, you know what? The belt does need lineage. It'll be Dustin Poirier versus Justin Gagey. Two of the nicest guys. Justin Gagey wins the belt. And now two even nicer people are somehow defending this. So now, apparently, every single time Justin Gagey fights or Max Holloway, they will be defending this belt. It's kind of a fugazi thing that they slap together to just for some fun years ago. And then now they slapped it together again to get three title fights on UFC 300. Either way, we get a cool five round featured fight that should be some fun. We got Justin Gagey taking on Max Holloway. Justin Gagey, 25 and four overall, three and two in his last five. He is coming off that head kick, knockout win over Dustin Poirier to win the belt. Taking on Max Holloway. 25-7 and seven overall, 4-1 and one in his last five. He's coming off that retirement win over the Korean zombie. Two strikers. Justin Gagey actually has college wrestling experience, doesn't use it very often at all. He did take down Rafael Fizaev or Fiziev in that fight. That was the first takedown he had shot in his entire UFC tenure. But he is a college wrestler. He hits crazy hard. There are memes floating around of every single person that Justin Gagey fought and what their face looked like after the fight. He absolutely turns people's faces into hamburger meat because of the insane power. He has his own insane chin. He lands at seven significant strikes per minute and somehow is hit with more strikes. He somehow has a negative striking differential even at that volume. Take it on Max Holloway. Longtime featherweight champion of the world. He is coming up to lightweight for the second time. The first time, he lost to Dustin Poirier. This time, it's for the BMF belt. When they asked him, why are you moving up? He said, if in this sport, if you sit around and wait, opportunities pass you by. So he's moving up. Max Holloway, nonstop busy striker. Multiple records in the UFC for largest significant strike differentials. Most significant strikes landed in a fight. It is insane the volume that this guy puts up. And it's because he also has a granite chin. And he's just pepper, pepper, pepper. Just throwing strikes out there all day, every day. He has nowhere near the power that Justin Gagey has. But he's far more accurate far more defensively sound. I do think Justin Gagey wins this fight. But it's I think it's literally only because of the power and the damage. I don't think he's going to stop Max Holloway, but I do think for every three strikes that Max lands is like one strike from Justin. And the stats might literally look like this. This fight might look like Cheeto Vera versus Rob Font. It's sort of a deep cut there, but if you go back and watch that fight, Rob Font outstruck Cheeto Vera. He landed two to one. But Cheeto land with far more power, had him rocked a few times, and had Rob's face just a mess. I think that's what this fight looks like. I think Max Holloway's the better striker, the cleaner striker. I think he outstrikes Justin Gagey, but the power and the damage will be too much, and Justin will get a decision here. Justin's my pick. What do you think, Jakey boy? Max is the better striker. He's the better I striker. Right? He, he's the better striker. It's going to be a mostly striking matchup. He's going to be the better striker. I mean, these guys are going to be shooting takedowns. These guys are going to be grappling. They're going to stand in there. They're going to box. And I would urge people to go back and watch that Dustin Poirier fight. Because I think the, the general consensus and what people remember is, oh, Max went to 155, got the shit beat out of him. Right? I mean, he really couldn't hang with 155. He couldn't hang with Dustin. And in, early in that fight, you, you could see that he was affected by the, the 155 power a little bit. Right, a little bit more than his 145 shot, uh, fights against a guy like Volk. I would say that Dustin is a much better boxer than 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 Justin Gagey. So when Max was doing his in the pocket thing, Dustin can hang with pretty much anybody in the boxing. Where Justin is a little bit more outside, a little bit more wild, a little bit. I don't want to say telegraph because he's a, he's a good striker in his own right. I mean, he was he went up against Fizayev and, and really went toe to toe with Fizayev. And Fizayev is a really good striker. Fizayev brawled a little bit too much. Yeah, but he Ma abandoned but, his technique in that. But fight. Max Holloway in the pocket versus Dustin was still getting hit. Where against Justin, I think he's going to have a little bit more success. Five round fight. 
I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the stats too. And the reason why I go back and, and watch a Dustin Poirier fight is he had some say. He, out, he outstruck Dustin Poirier in four of the five rounds. I know it was a 49 46 decision. A lot of it was because of the damage that Dustin was able to inflict. Holloway staying around a little bit too much. He was out. He outstruck Dustin. He outstruck him four of the five rounds. In this fight against a guy like Justin, not only do I think that he can he can have the volume and, and the the wherewithal to, to stay out of danger and be the better striker, but Dustin is more built for a five round striking match he will do he can do that he, five round striking boom easy peasy justin will have kind of these adrenaline dumps right he is a he will put some fucking shit behind his shots and when he starts gassing you could see he starts gassing and not only does he start gassing wait he's not a quitter right? i don't, don't want to act like justin's like a oh, fucking gonna quit in this fight or whatever but when he starts gassing he gets even more desperate and in that khabib fight he came in very fired up in that khabib, khabib fight he I mean, he said that he made a mistake you know with the emotions he was fucking tired after that for he was getting outstruck by khabib and was getting fucking tired as shit after one round and now you have max holloway in front of you Max Holloway has shown that he can take the damage. Guess who hasn't taken the damage in the past? Justin Gagey. He's been, he's been shit. He's been put out. Not Max Holloway. So this whole notion of Max Holloway coming in and being, oh, he's going to get destroyed. He's going to get knocked out. Max Holloway's, I've seen people being like, Max Holloway's on the decline. He's not the same guy anymore. Motherfuckers, his last fight, he fucking destroyed Zombie. And people go, oh, it was it was Zombie, dude. He fucking destroyed him. He was dominating that fight to a point where he tried to just submit Zombie because he felt bad. He didn't want to knock him out in front of his home fans. He said, let me try to submit this guy. And he almost submitted this guy. I wouldn't be surprised if Justin starts mixing some takedowns because he's starting to get tired. And, and, and Max Holloway is live for a submission. He's very live in those uh, scrambles. People under, underestimate his scrambling abilities. Max Holloway, I think, is the better striker. I think he's got the volume to wear down a guy like Justin. Maybe you can find a late finish. And I think he's going to win this fight. He's a better striker. I I agree with almost everything that you said. The only the I think the Rob Font uh, Cheeto Vera comparison I made is solid. No, do you do you think that was a good comparison? I thought that was pretty good. Rob Font outstruck him. He yeah, was the better striker. Yeah, but people don't hurt Max like like Rob was getting hurt in that fight. But Max has never been hit by somebody who hits as hard as Justin, so we don't know. He, he might not Dustin's get hurt. Power. Dustin hits just as hard as anybody. Not as hard as Justin. Yeah, I would beg to differ. I think he does. He knocked him out already with the hands. He didn't need a head kick. He yeah, knocked early, out early in his career. TKO. Okay, well, TKO. He knocked his ass out. So, Yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I agree Max is the better striker. The volume certainly could be a problem. I, I just think Justin wins with... He's just going to do a little bit more damage. And as we've seen in Vegas, the only thing anybody gives a shit about lately is, is your face bleeding. But Max can certainly win this fight. And the odds, so you're going to see the line open at minus 140, and now it's wide, 1 is 163. It looks like it's widening. It's actually tightening because just the other day, Justin Gagey was minus 2-something. And so it's slowly coming back. 70. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. It's tightening even though from the opening odds, it's a wider, but it, it is tightening a bit. And I think people are looking at it objectively and they're like, all right, you know, Justin does hit hard. But Max is still Max, and when have we seen Max and he's fucking, chinny and soft? And I'm telling you right now, too, this isn't, and you're going to hear it in the press conference probably, and you're going to see it this week. This isn't a typical Max, man. T Max is typically that fun-loving Hawaiian dude. This guy's kind of pissed off because he's heard all the fucking noise. He's heard everyone, and he's talked about it, about people saying he's got no chance, and what are you doing at 155, and all this stuff. And he's saying, listen, if you want to be that fucking guy, you have to take fights like this. This is what being a fucking fighter is all about. This is what being a real fucking bad motherfucker champion is all about. When these opportunities come up, it doesn't matter who it is, what weight class, you fucking take it and you prove everybody wrong. And he's got a little different demeanor this camp. I, I'll be rooting for him. I, I'll oh, be rooting Gage for him. going to kick his legs. Fuck that shit. Max has good footwork. He can fight from both stances. Yeah, I'm not worried about that. I, I, literally, the damage is the only thing. I think Max will. I think Max will out outland and outstrike Justin, but Justin strikes will, three to one damage, and then that's what'll happen. But either way, this should be a good fight. I am looking forward to it. Eighty eight hundred hours in DraftKings, seventy four hundred hours in DraftKings. It gets tricky because it is a five round fight, and both of these guys land at insane volume. You don't even need wrestling for these guys to cover their salaries. My recommendation are if you are confident in Justin, have him in your DraftKings lineup. If you're confident in Max, have him in his. Whoever wins will score well, even without a finish. You have 25 minutes, and they're landing seven significant strikes per minute, each of them. 
So and, I think uh, it scores well. And if you like the age thing, Justin is going to be uh, 36 years old this year. Isn't it funny that Max Holloway's the younger fighter in this no, matchup? 31. The dude's in the it's prime crazy. of his fucking life. He looks great, it's, too. I don't know if you've seen the fucking... I'll pull up a picture here, but... Well, it's. I actually had this comment pinned because I was going to say exactly what you're saying, that it's nuts that he's the younger fighter here. Yeah, he looks great. Put on an actual good 10 yeah, pounds. Yeah, I mean, he's fucking... Jesus Christ. Max looks locked in, huh? Well, if you want to unlock all of Jacob's picks and bets on this fight, all of my picks and bets on this fight, all of Artem, the AI, the artificial intelligence that we have picking fights, if you want to unlock all of that as well as the tools and everything else, it's only $10 a month for every single thing that we do in one beautiful package. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. We have two super chats. $1.99 from Parker. He said, do any books offer Dr. Stoppage as a prop? That is just under TKO. TKO, it's either KO, TKO. That's the prop bet. It doesn't distinguish well, between... Wants, well, I think he wants something. I understand what he's saying, but so... For like 9,000 odds or something. Yeah, the, the answer is nobody offers specifically Dr. Stoppage. They just group it under a TKO. So whether it's a Dr. Stoppage, TKO, referee, whatever it is, injury, it's just in there as that. And $2 from VHS, Jacob already addressed this, saying Gagey will take his legs. Max will get battered. Jacob disagrees. When's the last time statement. you saw who who has J Gagey really fucked up with leg kicks lately? It has been a while, but he does get to hang on to that reputation for a while. For some, reason. I mean, he definitely does have some good ones or whatever. And I, mean, I, I would not. You know, he's probably going to land a few or whatever, but it's not like it's anything too crazy. Next up at UFC 300, we have the co-main event of the evening for the first time in the history of the UFC. We have two Chinese fighters fighting for a title we have Wei Li Zhang defending her belt this is the second time she has had this belt and she will be defending it against Yan Zhanan in her first attempt to crack at a championship Wei Li Zhang 24 and 3 overall 3 and 2 in her last five coming off her first successful title defense of her second championship reign she's taking on Yan Zhanan 17 and 3 overall 3 and 2 in her last five coming off that knockout win over Jessica Andrade at this point, I think Wei Li is on her way to becoming one of the best female fighters of all time. Certainly, Amanda Nunes is the best female fighter of all time, but Wei Li has very good striking, insane wrestling. She puts it all together well. She's got good cardio. She moves forward. She improves at an incredible pace. And she is one of the very, very few people in this sport that lost their belt and then worked their way back and earned it again. Wei Li Zhang, in my opinion, is the real deal. She started as a striker, and she has evolved into a grappler. She has an incredible 19 takedowns in her UFC career, and she's coming off that title defense over Amanda Lamoche, where she outlanded her, are you sitting, Jacob? 163 to 24 significant strikes. What an astonishing gap that is she also had six takedowns she's taking on Jan Janan Jan's a very good boxer she's got well-timed strikes very clean technique she does not shy away from a dirty fight she is willing to bang it out inside of the pocket outside of her two UFC losses which were to Carla Esparza and Marina Rodriguez she has had some dominant wins in the UFC we saw power in her last fight over Jessica Andrade but that's the anomaly that's not who she is she's not the one punch she's not the knockout artist she's the decision striker i think Wei Li Zhang takes down yan janan as many times as she wants to does whatever she wants to i think Wei Li dominates this fight the line is moving just four days ago Wei Li was minus 330 or whatever the hell it was and now she's minus 500 i think she's going to cruise to well beyond that i was texting with somebody today i said Wei Li's the best value on this card and at the time she was minus 450 and he was like minus 450 isn't good value Minus 450 in and of itself is not good value, but in my mind, Wei Li should be minus 800. We watched Carla Esparza ragdoll Yan Janan. Wei Li is a better wrestler than all of them. I think Wei Li dominates this fight, and I think she's the closest thing you're going to get to a lock on this card outside of a very young in his career, Bo Nickel. What do you think? Jakey Bomba Lotz. Uh, yeah, I like I like Wei Li. I mean, Wei, Wei Li is a, uh, a a really good fighter, awesome personality. I mean, I <laughs> she is a great great fucking person. I have no issues with Wei Li. Here's how I see this fight, and I, it, and I thought about this uh, today. I was trying to think of of something to say in this breakdown to really kind of hone what I feel about this fight. 
I see this as the first, not the first time, but the second time that Usman fought Leon Edwards. Usman needed the takedowns, and he needed the takedowns in the control for fucking 25 minutes, or he was going to be in trouble because he could not hang on the feet, in my opinion, with Leon Edwards. I see this the exact same way. Usman is a good striker, but he, he his wrestling was at his core is what he needed in that fight, and eventually he made a mistake. It was very late. People call it a fluke or whatever it was, but he ended up getting knocked out. I believe that Wei Lee cannot hang on the feet. For 25 minutes in this fight. Now, you want to bring up the takedowns. And Wei Li has good takedowns. And she took down Lamos. And she, and she was mauling Lamos. And that was great. And it was a, a great fight for her. And she looked like she had good takedowns and all that stuff. Lamos is a plant your fucking feet. Not move. And when you make a move, just throw a wild overhand right. That's what she wants to do. She's very stationary. She's sitting here. And she wants to just bomb an overhand right. Jan... It's kind of like more of a Leon Edwards, Sean O'Malley. She's going to be moving left. She's going to be moving right. She, her footwork is much improved. She doesn't have better footwork than Amanda Lamos. Say it right now. You just compared Jan Janan to Sean O'Malley? I, I said she's got, sure. she moves around like a Sean O'Malley, like a Leon oh. Edwards. No, you're saying oh. she doesn't have better you just footwork compared than Amanda her, No, no. You compared no, no, no. her to two current reigning champions. You said she you has scoff. the exact same footwork. And she's as about the defending... to be the fucking champion, you dumb piece of shit. I'd love to do bet you. you. Think, do you I'd think love to bet that you. she does not have better footwork than Amanda La fucking Lamoche? Yes, that no? was not the debate. That, that is the, the debate, debate I'm making right now. I'd love you for I'd love for you to answer it. I scoffed at you comparing Jan Why Janan's footwork. Why can't you answer footwork. the question, you politician? Yes or no? Does she have because better I think footwork it's about than Amanda the I think it's about the same Yeah, I Amanda's. bet you fucking do, you fucking pussy uh, But bitch. I am positive she's gonna it's dance nothing like Sean O'Malley. And Wayne is going to struggle getting the takedowns because she's not going to be stationary. And it, I believe she probably is going to get a takedown or two, but if she doesn't control this fight for more than for more than 60% of the fight, she's going to lose this fight. She is not the better striker. And I believe... That And I said in my quick pick video that probably 70 to 75 percent of this fight is going to be on the feet. Wei Li will strike. She doesn't go all in on the wrestling and she's going to struggle to try to go to close the distance get to go like Jan. And if the, the, the fight is 75 percent striking, guess what? I'm picking the better striker, and Jan is much better striker than Wei Li. We've seen Wei Li get chinned. We've seen her get hurt. She will engage in extending combinations, and Wei Li can pick her apart on the way to the title and new. Angelo, name the amount. We're on bet openly right now. I have, uh, name hold it. on, let, I just, I think I have $350 left, so I'll do all of it. All in. Okay. Do you want to like send it or do you want game. me to? You send it. I can't do multiple things at once. All right. Uh, so we're split on this fight. Jacob is determined to, I, honestly, you're going to have a bad card. And it sucks because last week you had a phenomenal card. You had you did an unbelievable job last week. And you're about to have a bad card. And it's, and it's going to suck for you. And I, I feel bad because you're going to be live streaming this while Jan is getting tossed around like how I tossed you around, honestly, in that gym. It's going to be bad. Yeah, I got a quote here for you. $9,200 Wei Li Zhang will be in my DraftKings lineup. Will be. What's your quote? I'd love to hear your quote. A quiet line. You're not quiet, you fucking muppet. I'm not sitting here. You're the one that's like just all of a sudden just. You literally yep, screamed. Yep, yep. You literally I did screamed. my breakdown, but you're the one that feels defensive and need to follow it up about. I'm going to the worst card of all time. All those stuff. Yep, 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 yep. I just. I, some of these picks. So I, why don't. <laughs> you picked Cody Brundage and Jan Janan. You might as well parlay them for plus a million. I have a parlay with Jan, Charles, Max, and Cody, and it's fifty dollars to win twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> I'm not sure. Honestly, it's so I, funny. I hope it. I, I genuinely, with all my heart, I always I hope put that my it, money where my mouth yeah. is. I'm about no, to no, do it again. Right you do. Here. You do. Yeah, well, that's what happens. When, yeah. No, wow. I'm do. so glad I can put fucking eighty-five dollars on Jan because Angel has no fucking money. I have three hundred and fifty left in bed openly, but next week I'll have. Way more than three hundred and fifty. Uh, yeah. Eighty left. to win three thirty six is what's gonna be. You have to pay three thirty six and you're gonna get back eighty. Nice. So next week we'll bet for something. See how that works. Bet openly, the best odds in the game. And the reason you use bet openly is it's peer to peer. You get to bet people. I know Jacob, he would have paid up otherwise, but it's much more official this way. But you don't know half these people you're arguing with in the chat. Send them a bet openly link. This way, if they lose, they pay. Are you going to have your girl, Jan, in your 
DraftKings lineup. It's only seven thousand dollars, Jacob. Discount Easy. of a lifetime. Five rounds. Late finish. There you go. <laughs> so I'll bet. I'll I'll go into my pocket. A thousand dollars. She doesn't finish. Whaley. You want to do that? Money run out this. Yeah. I mean, look at the what the odds are. You're the one that's always you're the one that always wants like even money on like plus fucking six hundred odds for no goddamn reason. Not for no reason. I want better odds. She's plus so nine fifty inside the distance. So yeah, I'll bet you a hundred to win. I'm not. Yeah. See, that's I'm not, not going to do that. Well, that's the odds, Angelo, Mister Confident. Yeah, well, well, I'll bet you well, straight I'm, up though. Because I'm not foolish. That is, that literally is foolish to even think that somebody would do that. To bet straight up on a plus 950 odds. I mean, you're not the brightest bulb. I've taken advantage of you yep, in the yep, past. Yep. Barking dog. Anyway, uh, my max bet, 336. Bet is placed. Is the bet placed? Place bet. Bet is placed. I took your bet. Guys, if you want to unlock all the rest of the picks and the bets, I promise you we are aligned on some of these. Go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top. It's only $10 for an entire month. You're not only going to get the picks, the bets, the round line leans, but you're also going to get tools and everything else that you need heading into Fight Week, week each and every event. Next up, at UFC 300, we have the main event of the evening. We have Alex Pajeda defending his light heavyweight championship belt for the very first time. This is his second belt in the UFC. He has set a record, I believe. For most number of title fights and title defenses in the fewest amount of fights in the UFC. He's taken on Jamal Hill. Jamal Hill, former light heavyweight champion himself. He did not lose the belt. He blew out his Achilles playing basketball, so he relinquished the belt. This is his opportunity to get it back. Alex Bejeda, as we all know, former professional kickboxer. Kickboxing beast. He is insanely huge. He hits insanely hard. He was the middleweight champion of the world. Moves up to light heavyweight. Somehow still bigger than most of this weight class. He is not the fastest guy in the division. He doesn't have the best footwork in the division. But he has such crazy, insane power. Everything from short hooks to giant straight rights. Everything he does looks like it hurts. He is working on his grappling. It's not great, but he did take down Jan Blahovich. And he is always going to be dangerous on the feet. He's taking on Jamal Hill. As I mentioned, former light heavyweight champion of the world. He won his belt by beating Glover Teixeira on short notice. Glover, no, Jamal was short notice in that fight, right? That was when Jiri dropped and Jamal stepped in on short notice? I don't listen to what you said. I forget. I, yes, I believe Jamal was short notice and Glover was full camp. By the way, Jamal Hill beat Glover Teixeira. Pretty straightforward. There is a video circling of Jamal Hill's footwork. In that fight, it is literally just a zoom in video of Jamal Hill's feet. And if you don't know what you're watching, the issue with the footwork is he's literally crossing his feet. Like it's some of the worst footwork you've ever seen in your life. It's actually crazy if all you're doing is looking at his feet and he's crossing his legs and he's stepping off and doing very odd things that you should not be doing in a fight like this. And that video is being used to say, look, Jamal Hill sucks. I disagree with that sentiment. Jamal Hill, I think, is a good striker. He's accurate. He's fast down the middle. He has a 7-3 to striking differential, which means he does a very good job staying on the outside, throwing what he needs to throw, avoiding danger. I do not think he's the most powerful striker in the division. That is literally Alex, even though he's a blown-up 185-pounder. I do think two things here. I'm going to pick Alex Pajeda to win this fight, but with low confidence, and here's why. On one hand... I think Jamal might literally be the better pure boxer in this matchup. He's not nearly, he's not going to have the power at all, but he's much more defensively sound and he keeps his strikes a lot tighter. I watched a video. I forget exactly what the title was and I tried to find it and I couldn't, but it was called something like Alex Pajeda being allergic to jabs. And it was just Alex just absorbing any straight punch up the middle, just bang, anything people threw right up the middle, hit him. And that concerned me. I was like, holy shit, Jamal Hill, that's exactly how Jamal Hill throws strikes. But then I look at the Jamal Hill situation. First of all, no offense, Jamal, and I know you watch this because you clipped me breaking you down before and threw it on your Instagram. He's looking soft, like real soft. And he has been at multiple UFC events the last six months looking like fat as shit, honestly. And looks, then when... Looks fine on the embedded... Well, then, but okay. So then they announced this fight. They announced that this was the main event. And Jamal Hill said, yeah, they asked me the other day. And I said, yes. 
So Jamal Hill went from no fight, no conversations about fight, to the UFC 300 main event. And we're talking, this was announced in the last couple of months. And he's coming off that wild Achilles surgery. So I think Alex was always the more dangerous fighter. I do think he's going to get hit a lot, as he does get hit a lot. But I think Alex can pull this off. I think Jamal, another long layoff guy. I've been fading the long layoff guys in these fights. Alex hits way too hard. If you make one mistake and you're fighting Jamal, it may rock you a little bit, but you can work through it. If you make one mistake and you're fighting Alex, you can be in some very real trouble and get put out. So I am going to lean Alex Bajeda here, but I'm not confident enough in that to bet any money. What do you think, Jakey boy? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to harp on the, and I'm not going to talk about another man's you know physical features. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a professional athlete and he's going to be coming in and he's a professional. But I, I do want to talk a little bit about the Achilles. I, I'm not going to use that as an excuse for this fight, but that's a serious fucking injury. And yeah. that was a situation where he, it wasn't, okay, he did all the rehab, and then he's able to train for a while, and then he's able to fight again. The last six months or whatever, a lot of this last part is just rehabbing, not training again. It's just rehabbing the the Achilles injury. So I think that does play a part. But even a, a healthy, good-to-go, you know, prime of his career, Jamal Hill, I don't think he holds a candle to Alex Bejeda in the striking. I, I just do not see it. I don't see it in the footwork that people mention. I don't see it in the... I mean, the power we're talking... Everyone acts like Jamal Hill is like this powerful puncher. This is a 205-pound man who on the regional scene is going to decisions. You don't really see that very often. For a UFC powerful puncher, they're usually smoking everybody on the regionals. You might get occasional tough guy or whatever. Like three or four decisions on the regional scene, the people he's knocked out in the UFC, OSP, Jimmy Crute, Johnny Walker. Some of the chinniest guys we've even seen in this division go into a decision with the 49-year-old Glover Teixeira. Kind of struggling at times with the Tiago Santos. He ended up finishing him. Another 40-year-old. I think his resume is a little bit fraudulent. I think his striking is a little bit overrated. And he's came in and said that, I'm, I'm not going to take down Alex Pajeda. Why the fuck would you not? Why would you fuck up your money, <laughs> Jamal? And, and, and maybe it's a bluff and maybe he's just he talking shit, but I believe him. And I believe his coach, when they say, because they've said it, that we believe, and you hear from other people, they've convinced the entire world, we believe Jamal Hill is the better striker. Jamal Hill says, I'm the better striker, I'm going to knock this guy out. Guess what? You're just not. You, I mean, you're just not. This guy is a world-renowned kickboxer. And I know that the optics, right, you see the videos, Angelo, I mean, the guy fights like this, and you see him, he's back, and he's taking <laughs> shots, and you see his hands up like this. The first time I saw Alex Bahita fight, I'm like, this is the guy? Right? This is the guy that's the world champion that's beat Izzy, that's knocked this guy out, that's going to come in and take over the UFC. Like, this is, I mean, the guy that's moving like this, and all of a sudden you see him throw that left hook, and you're like, oh, now I get it. And I think the same thing is going to happen here. Jamal Hill's going to come in, feeling good. He's going to be backing Alex up. He's going to be popping, popping, seeing the head snap back, and then boom, that shot comes. And like you said, when that shot comes, most people do not survive that type of shot from Alex Pajeda. Now, Jamal Hill has started to walk back those comments a little bit. And I don't know if it's nerves. I don't know if it's like whatever it is. But he said, what his, his latest quote is, if Alex puts his hands on me, then he's going to have to, some issues because my top pressure is crazy. It's like, whoa. I didn't think we were oh, wrestling. Oh, so you are going to wrestle. Yeah, I, didn't yeah. think, I, didn't we were, I didn't think we were wrestling <laughs> grappling here. So now it's like if Alex grabs me, then I'm going to take him down. I'm not going to shoot and take that anyway. If I'm Jamal Hill, dude. You know you can wrestle this guy, probably. You know you can take him down and have that control. You know you can win this fight this way. Fucking do it, dude. You're coming off an Achilles injury. You don't need to try and prove anything. Let's get in there. Let's get the takedowns. Let's get the control. Let's win the belt. Let's make some fucking money, Jamal. But if he wants to fuck around and he really believes that he's the better striker and he's going to stand in front of this guy and he's going to have success until he doesn't, he's going to get put out. And I think that's what's going to happen. I think he really actually does believe he's a better striker and he's going to find a, he's going to be in some trouble like everyone else is. I mean, Sean Strickland did the same thing. I don't need to wrestle. I can strike with this yeah. guy. Yeah. Ooh, here's a jab. Here's a jab. And Alex's like, okay, here's the jab. Here's the jab. Whoop. And there it was. So I think the same thing happens to Jamal. It's just this overconfidence. It can really, what they say, what's the, the quote on the office? The, the liquor of the fool, but the food of the, what is it about? Right. Confidence, the office. No. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Victor yeah. Vikram says it. Office. Oh yeah, Vi yeah, 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 yeah. Vikram. That guy. That was a great confidence. Good it's the food of the wise man, but the liquor of the fool. There you go. Yeah. There you go. There's your quote. Uh, listen, I, I want Alex Pajeda to win. I love. I just. I love the mystery, the enigma. This guy just showed up. I. 
I would love for him to win, and then he does move up to heavyweight because that was the rumor. The rumor for this card was that Alex Pajeda was moving up to heavyweight to fight Tom Aspinall. Obviously, that didn't happen. We got this fight. But um, I am in the camp of, I think Jamal has the straighter, more accurate strikes, and I think he will land on Alex because Alex does get hit. But I'm 100% in your camp with the whole, the Achilles is a very serious injury. Jamal Hill was not in a training camp. He didn't know that this fight was even an option, and it was presented to him. I'm sure they paid him a fortune, and he took it. That is very different than my dream was to fight on UFC 300 and now I'm fighting on, you know, that's a very, that's an opportunistic fight and you're crazy to not take it. He did the right thing, but I don't know if he's ready yet and he's going to need that footwork. He's going to need every bit of mobility in his feet fighting Alex Pajeda. Uh, $8,300 in DraftKings for Alex, 79 for Jamal Hill. Uh, I think you're just going to have to pick your side. I think Alex is probably the better value at just a couple more dollars because of the power, because of what he's done to people and how he finishes them. Obviously, Izzy finished Alex, but um, you know, that was just a phenomenal setup by Izzy. That's, yeah, that's speed. And they fought and four more, times. Yeah, that's more speed and precision. And and, and people and people are going to say that, oh, you got, Izzy has no power. Izzy knocked out Robert Whitaker, Paulo Costa. He has power when he wants to throw it. Izzy's just typically a point fighter. But if he wants yeah. to sit on a punch... He can fucking knock anybody out. And he sat on that one. I mean, he fucking sat on that one because he was in trouble. Well, plus they fought four times. There's just, you just learn somebody's cadence at that point. So either way, Jake and I. Always playing pulse. Jacob, yeah, yeah. He got his ass kicked. <laughs> he's, he's, he's what he's happened. in big trouble. Yeah. Well, Jacob and I squarely on the same side of this. Well, not squarely. I'm a little lower confidence than he is. But we are on the same side of this fight. And we're on the same side of premium as well. So why don't you sign up, unlock the tools, the picks, the bets, the round line leans, and more for only $10 a month. I want to sincerely thank every single one of you. I think Like the spiked, stream if you haven't already. I think we spiked at 900-something live viewers. Thank you all very much. That was an incredible, incredible boost. Uh, we do have this tomorrow. comment. I, Teep didn't see when I stood up, so I'm going to do that for you again real quick. Um you buffoon. But uh, either way, become a premium member. It's only $10 a month. Not only have we tried to build the best premium service on the planet, we also live and breathe by premium members. So that is the lifeblood of this. It's a great way to support us. Even if you don't have the $10 to support through premium, like, subscribe, do all those things. We appreciate every single one of you being here. If you do want to be a premium member, you get the tools, you get the picks, you get the optimizer, you get more analysts, including the artificial intelligence guys thank you so much jakey boy you got any last words for the people after a two hour and 41 minute live stream lock of the week tomorrow i'm excited about this one it is literally angel's already seen it, it is the, the greatest edit i've ever put together so I hopefully agree with guys that hopefully guys look forward to that uh we'll post that on the gram and stuff and and get people involved with it but um i think we're gonna surprise some people with some lock of the week i've seen all the the guesses in discord and i don't know if anybody's guessed it yet but i haven't seen it either what's so funny here here just real quick before we go this is the epitome of YouTube. James Kuyu has been shitting on me all night in the live chat. Just just dogging me. And he's like, you guys are great. Thanks for making my night. Well, you didn't make my night. You were mean as hell the entire stream. But thank you for being here. Thanks for the comment. We appreciate every single one of you.